it's your fucking party uh what's great is i actually did press the record button before you said that so i'm leaving that in so welcome to episode 16 of counterpoints that's and, why you uh, cover your mouth so you can change it in post-production yeah. if you have the number wrong episode 16 of counterpoints i'm usual host Dorin, of his co-host here moses as explained at length in the last episode for about eight minutes so if you didn't watch that go and watch that episode up there or something if you don't, then fuck off. Just watch the rest. It's free. You're not even paying for this. You, I owe you nothing, basically. You, you know, you should thank me. But anyway, so for this episode, last time we talked, you were just about to begin Northern Arena, the tournament that's like all the NA teams, hell yeah, and obviously Immortals, etc. Now, first and foremost, the first question I have to ask about that Moses is. <laughs> anytime there's a tournament that not many people have heard of like I know there was a Northern Arena last year as well I think that was also yeah, NA yeah. teams but it's not a famous tournament and so this one was a lot more stacked than the last one was so a lot of people were watching it and there were all these delays and like pauses and issues is there anything you can say about that because unfortunately from the outside that always you always naturally assume that just means whoever ran it was incompetent you know unfortunately yeah, um, I, I mean, obviously, they being a new organizer, they they had some some things they messed up on. But I would say the biggest, like the biggest delays they had on day one. Um, I mean, it, it was just kind of unfortunate for them. This is actually hilarious, and, and this is this is a lot of what the community doesn't realize. But the, the original delay on on the uh, for that tournament on day one was caused by like an internet outage, like a citywide internet outage, um, by the company, the service provided by Bell. Um, well, okay. Bell was the lead sponsor of the tournament, so oh. we couldn't exactly go on stream and be like, oh, we're sorry, our, our lead sponsor has messed everything up, our headline sponsor has screwed up, and their entire service has crumbled for the, for the entire city. So that's why we have a delay. But that was like the opening delay um, of, of, the, of the show, which was, which was okay. incredible, actually. See, I would say that they can't say that and then joke like, haha, well, no, you would definitely won't be doing that event next year, Moses. But first of all, no one even knows if there will be one of those events next year. And secondly, did you see the talent lineup for that? You were a fucking rock star compared to them. <laughs> so I don't think the joke wouldn't even work. It's, it, the problem is it's not even plausible as a joke, you know? It'd be pushing yeah. reality too much, you know? Uh, okay, so at Northern Arena, if you remember coming into the tournament, young Moses here picked Cloud9 to win. He's all in on that one. Uh, the fella called Thorin, he just picked that Immortals team. You know, he just thought Immortals was probably the best team there. And in the final, uh, the team called Immortals actually beat Cloud9 and won the tournament. So what are your feelings on Immortals taking the whole thing? Uh, well, first, I want to say, if Cloud9 had won that, this conversation would have been you saying, yeah, but there was that fucked up situation <laughs> at the beginning of the third map, and all of our predictions have We'll never avoided. know. We'll never know. So. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I, I thought... Uh, Listen, Moses, I mean, if I don't get to win this point now, I'll forfeit this whole podcast. <laughs> and the memes. There we go. Listen, Immortals are my guys. I'm riding with yeah, them. Yeah. So, it's your yeah, boys. Yeah. They learned it from the best. Um, yeah, no, I thought it was. I thought it was a, a pretty sick final, as all things considered. So, something weird about Immortals is um, I thought actually they, especially on um, Train, the second map of that finals. Yeah. I think they outplayed Cloud Nine. I think they really exposed some of Cloud Nine's inability um, with a lack of the tactical mind um, to to adjust in the middle of matches. Um, so I thought Immortals actually played a pretty cool game. I, even on Train, I think they outplayed them. It was just all the clutch rounds, all the individual star performances um, were by Cloud9 players. And that's that's something I've noticed with Immortals is they they have Phelps, they have Bolts, but like outside of that, they don't have like too much star power. And it just it, it doesn't feel like they... There are games every once in a while where it doesn't feel like they are like the best team in the server in this case it was but like they do, they just like win some games you know what I, you know what i mean like even against like Virtus pro uh, when they won that bo5 it feels like they shouldn't be winning it but they but they do just pull out the win um, which is pretty interesting but I, I thought i mean obviously that third map with all the issues just shows some resiliency um, but overall I, I think it's just kind of um it's it's where they're supposed to be they're one of the better teams in north america uh and they, they put a stop to a pretty hot cloud nine team okay so one of the interesting things about this tournament was, if you ask me, I mean, I remember when I did my video a few months back, it was actually just after Gfinity, I think, when they won that tournament. Uh, yeah. And so at the time, they were actually Temple Storm, I think, still. I, when, when I did my video about Immortals, like, the guy I really zoned in on, as I was like, to me, the best player in Immortals is Phelps. I think he's, like, the most skilled player, and I noticed whenever he has really big tournaments, that's when they look like this really dangerous team that, you know, maybe they're going to crack, like, top five in the world, all that, all that good stuff. 
But what's funny is, in making that video, I had to kind of like dispel at the time what was a myth, which is everyone had obviously gotten super hyped about Henny, N1, or whatever you want to call him, right? And the whole thing yeah. is, he had that quality to him where anytime he did have a highlight round, it would look amazing because his firing speed is unreal. But I actually noticed when I looked through all the games, I went back and watched VODs, he, he was like a very strange player in as much as it's like he only got crazy kills, it felt like. You know, he would get these great highlights and these really sick op shots, but for someone who's landing those sick op he wasn't dominating the game, you know. He wasn't, like, taking over. He wasn't having the crazy stats. But actually, at Northern Arena, for, like, this was a tournament where he went nuts, right? He had a, yeah, he had a, he had a really good tournament. Um, and then it was kind of like the other the other secondary one was Bolts and Phelps. Like, they, like, kind of alternated matches as, like, that second guy. Um, but, yeah, Henny, uh, overall, and, and this is maybe the tendency of operas who have this kind of style is, I mean, this is not against the best operas in the world, not against the best teams in the world. This is against NA competition. So that kind of style can be very dominant because there's, um, there's a lot more mistakes by your opponents, and there's also a lot less. You're not getting punished as much for those kind of plays, you know, like those those really flashy plays where you're trying to get that flick shot, low percentage but looks cool. You don't you don't get punished as much as uh, you know as you as you would against the European teams. But um, I mean, overall, he was he was a monster. I mean, he was hovering around like 1.3 ratings for the entire tournament uh, on HLTV. So I mean, he was just kind of dominant from start to finish. Sure, and then obviously. In the final, the deciding map came down to be overpass. Now, if you remember the way the final played out, so, okay, there was Cobblestone was the first map, and if you know anything about the history of this team going back in Temple Storm, Cobblestone was always the, Cobblestone was always their map. That was like the map that they really broke out with. This is one of the reasons why I actually always stress, as I did on the last episode, I think people went too far tying the fact that like luminosity were brazilian and then this team were brazilian therefore they must play the same style therefore they must have all learned it from fallen it's like no not at all because even their maps were like totally different like for example what was interesting about this final for me is i remember when i did that video about them ages ago their best maps were cobble and inferno and obviously inferno got took out and i was like shit does this just mean they're yeah. gonna get handicapped now and actually the rest of the maps you know they didn't have that deeper map pool back then gfinity when i watched them back then but ever since then watching dream max summer going forwards well obviously the decider here was on overpass and actually they win on overpass here and that's a map they've gradually brought in their map but that used to be their permaban before they used to never play that so what did you think of the third map overpass because obviously cloud nine themselves have actually shown improved ability on that map over the last few months um i i would have to i would probably have to watch that watch that vod back again i know they had i mean both they had a, a very very good um ct side i believe it was it both teams were pretty dominant on the ct side so i mean th that just became a wall and that was really where henny came to play with his awp on that ct side um he was a beast, and Cloud9 couldn't really do anything. He was he was getting a lot of early kills during Cloud9's attack, so it just kind of stalled everything out. Uh, and then also, uh, again, I think actually across this whole series and Overpass especially, um, he, this this was a huge impact. I think, but um, I don't think I think Immortals won all six pistol rounds in that series, uh, which which is pretty nuts. So I mean that, that certainly helps out a lot. But um, once you once you got Henny rolling with the AWP on that defensive side, the eight bombs that was pretty much shut down, and you could kind of see um, Immortals just very very quickly shrank the map. Like Cloud9 just didn't really have anywhere to go um, once Henny got rolling with that AWP. So I mean it, overall it was great, but but again I think um, especially in this. There were a couple stretches where Immortals kind of like would get beat up for like six, seven rounds in a row, and then Cloud9 would kind of figure something out. But then, um, I mean, Immortals just kind of adjusted so much better, and Cloud9 couldn't really handle it. They didn't really know. They didn't really have any ability to adjust of their own, and that's kind of the the story of this series, where where I saw Cloud9 doing very, very good, and then getting stopped, and then not knowing where to go from there. They they couldn't find the solution to the adjustment that Immortals made, and that that was very true on uh, Overpass as well. So where do you actually think this puts Immortals then? Where, where would they be in the world for you? Because, I mean, an interesting thing, when HLTV.org updated their rankings, Immortals are almost nowhere in sight, you know? I mean, this is a team that won Dreamhack Summer, now they won this tournament, that won Gfinity. Obviously, Gfinity was a while ago. Maybe that doesn't count as much, you know? But, yeah. but it's like, they, here's the thing. It's true they haven't done well in the majors. They haven't qualified for any. But it's like, outside of that, they're pretty solid, I think. I mean, I look at them and I'm like, this team are obviously for me on the brink of like being a legit tier one team. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't think they have the credit that they should. Um, I, I, I don't think this tournament specifically would give them very many points, obviously, because of the, just the level of competition. Um, and actually, yeah, they're, they're current, they're thirteenth right now in those HLTV rankings, and they moved down three spots, which is uh, a little bit of a bummer. I'd have them. Let's see. 
This is this would actually be pretty tough to place him. So I have him right around ten. I don't think that's bad at all. Um, just because we have seen some dips from some teams, but you have Heroic who's made a sick run, Dignitas who's been improving. I think putting them right around ten wouldn't be a bad idea. Uh, just because we haven't. I, I think their biggest problem is that they haven't been to all the tournaments. Like you said, they're not qualifying for the majors, but they you know they're not going to the tournaments like Star Ladder. They're, I don't. Are they going to be in Bucharest? Like I don't see them at too many international events that are actually going to help them move up. Let so. Me have a look. We see them in like spurts, you know. We see them, you know, every once once every two months at like a big international event. Yeah. No, so, they, I mean, they won't be at Bucharest, and obviously yeah. in the last season they weren't in E League, but they have the chance to get into it this time. Yeah, I mean that's that's the big thing is just like the the number of the amount we actually see them play. I, I don't think they're at enough events because that's the crazy thing. Like even even when I think about it, and I'd have to I'd have to like go sit down and go over some things, but like. They they beat Cloud Nine um, at this at this tournament on land in a BO3 series they win it, yeah. but I don't know like what, do you put them above Cloud Nine for that because Cloud Nine outside of like outside of Immortals beating them they have some they have they have some good wins now uh, you know when they were at Star Ladder they had some good wins there against European teams so how do you kind of rank this Cloud Nine team who's been just you know been storming the North American region outside of losing to Immortals Immortals at the land uh, and good wins over European teams but Immortals don't have those wins over European teams. Uh, I mean, here's the thing. Like for my ranking, you know, mine works off a three month basis. So I'd have yep. to look when the dates are, but I'm pretty sure the dates wouldn't yet have gone by for Dreamax Summer. So Dreamax Summer would right. still be counted for me, and that was the tournament where they beat Nip in the final. So that was, that, well, yeah. that was pretty legit, you know. I mean, yeah, it's the yeah, old godsend, but, but you know that one that one counts for sure. So that's the thing. I, I for me, I I think it's bizarre. I actually made a tweet about this today. It's really it just shows how really weird people are at like jumping on hype trains and then jumping off them. And it's like they, they're they just as extreme in whichever direction they go. Because if you remember when Tempo Storm had that little run at the beginning of the year where just online only, they qualified for all those lands. They qualified for the, I think it was, uh, let me think which ones would it have been. So they qualified for, I am kind of eat, say, mm -hmm. I think which other one it was they qualified for. Was maybe, it the G maybe, Finity Siva? I'm not sure. There was there was like two lands they went through. If you remember, they beat basically all the NA competition they do. They beat like Team Liquid and Cloud9. And so at the time, everyone was like, holy shit, they're going to be super duper good. And then here's the thing. If you remember, the first big land they had was actually the Columbus qualifier where they kind of shit the bed a bit. And unfortunately, like N1 actually kind of shit the bed, actually. They weren't that great at that time. And if you remember, Phelps was like fairly new to the team as well. So he, he hadn't really like come to come to play in the sense he has now. And then the next land they had was Katowice. And that was the one where they were really good, actually. Like Navi barely got past them. Although yeah. They would have been top four there. So that was looking really good. And what's funny is at this point in time, everyone was super hard on that hype train. Like people were literally like, this team's top five in the world. Like they're going to be the next great team. Like blah, blah, blah. And here's the thing at the time, I was kind of going like, well, I mean, let's pump the brakes a bit. They've had one good line at the moment, you know. That even then, like, you know, this is a classic trend with me. I hate it where people are like, yeah, but they almost beat that team. So they basically did. It's like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> Listen, if you want to talk about you almost beat a team, but and therefore you did, let's go look at the careers of Astralis or something, you know. But by, <laughs> by that logic, they're like top three all time or so, right? If you just yeah, get, if you get wins for the champions. ones you were close in, doesn't matter. So the point I made was like, well, you know, let's see how they go. But this is what's bizarre, Moses. In the in the months after that. Aside from the major qualifiers, they did win me over, actually. They did show me, like, a, a, a level of improvement month to month. They managed to, like, shift up the balance in the team. So, like I said, Phelps became this really good player, and then Bolts was, like, a stable force. <laughs> then N1 could exist as that really streaky player, but as the third best yeah. player. You notice in my model for how you make a team, usually the streaky player should be, like, the third best player. You know, you don't want him as, like, the superstar, etc. So, if you, it was all fitting together. It was all looking good. They were winning events. They were doing well, like, on the Tier 2 and breaching into Tier 1 level. And what's funny is around the time they started to get really legit and i was like this team's improving a lot everyone else was like oh, i'm off that hype train see ya i'm, I'm off and i was like what what it's getting good now no listen it's actually going somewhere now they're like fuck you they're all shit I, like, I, I don't know how this happened moses what's what do you think happened like don't do you find this puzzling that now everyone doesn't seem to give them any credit i think th i think the big thing is the major qualifiers i think stick out to most people uh and then and then also right at the moment i think that the next big thing is obviously uh zeus joining and changing up the, the the way that lineup is is formed, um, so I think maybe that should throw some doubt. But I, I certainly think they I certainly think they deserve a little bit more credit from Immortals, or I mean from uh, from HLTV at, at 13th place. I think they they should be a little bit higher than that. Um, but yeah, it, it seems like everyone. Um, 
everyone not from Brazil is sleeping on these guys right now. Uh, part of it too, I think there's got to be just some annoyance from from all the support they get from Brazilians. Uh, like sure. that luminosity, that luminosity team that yeah. came up. Like the justification of some some people for for why I'm, like this this new luminosity, this new Brazilian lineup is going to be amazing is like. Look at what SK and look at what Immortals have done when they're given the opportunities. Yeah. This Brazilian team is going yeah. to be the third best in North America in, you know, a month. And I'm just like, Jesus Christ, you can't give them credit for what other teams have done. Yeah. That makes no sense whatsoever. No, well, that's an example, unfortunately, of where someone's taken a very simplistic storyline and they've just applied it. And it obviously, don't, none of the other factors fit, you know. I mean, that's why I always stress. What's funny is the reason I always stress the fact that Immortals is a very different team in map pool, style of play, like even the, the strengths of the star players and the balance is because what I'm trying to tell you is, I'm trying to tell you, give them more credit. Like they didn't, they're not just a poor man's SK. In fact, they're, they're very, very different. So what's great is their success, they made it off their own backs. Now, sure, they got a leg up in as much as someone gave them an, uh, gave them an organization they could play for. Not, you need the basics, you know. But the whole point is there's other teams, I mean, NA teams, for example, that have had the same opportunities and haven't done any of this stuff with it. So it's certainly not the idea. I mean, listen, I'll, I, I won't deny it. I actually initially myself was skeptical when I saw those early in the year when they were doing all those weird results online to qualify for those ones. A part of me did think, oh, wait a minute, in the Snapchats, wasn't Fallen stood behind them. So I thought maybe he's just yeah. like shot calling something. I'll, I'll admit that's what I thought because at the time they looked too good for a team that's coming out of nowhere. But the point we're making here is uh, it, 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 they really are another outlier. They are this other crazy team from Brazil that play a very different style, but themselves are very successful. Unfortunately, that doesn't mean, right, well, the next best team from Brazil surely will know. Unfortunately, they have to prove it on their own merits. And at the moment, if you look at what the other Luminosity team did so far, admittedly, they haven't played much. I, yeah. There's no reason right now to ever imagine they'll be like a top 10 team ever. We yeah, have no, no basis, right? I haven't seen anything at all to, to make that happen. And I think they just, I think they literally just brought in Showtime as well. Um, well, from... that's the end of that then. So <laughs> yeah. there'll, there'll never be a team that ever needs to be seen ever again. Uh, at this point, just insert criticism of Showtime by people who even just played with him. So, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Cold exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I'll now bring in the guest witness, Cold Zero. Cold Zero. Does Showtime know the basics of Counter Strike? How Shut up, you ginger kid. Okay. Well, no need to be hostile. <laughs> Please witness. Like anyway. So, let me think where I was going with that. Okay. So yeah, immortals. Gen okay. So here's the thing. Okay. Bold prediction time. Yeah. Even though the next major qualifier is unreal. Like, you will never get a sicker major qualifier than what we're about to have, right? Because it's like an absolute murderer's row where, depending on the groups, I mean, there'll be some group... If a group of death happens there, I feel so bad because someone's not even getting out the qualifier. It will be, like, against Nip and fucking Envious. And, like, it's going to be unreal, right? But even so, I think Immortals makes the next major. And I think they're going to just continue on. Like, I don't know... Here's the thing. I don't know what the ceiling is. I don't know how much higher they can go. But the level they're at now is good. It's already good. And I think, for me, they're really primed against certain types of opponent to be a really great upset team so i don't think they're going to go to like they're not going to go top five just on like overall ability but they can certainly beat some of the best teams in my opinion so i, I expect things to continue for them yeah i i don't oh my god i'm trying to even that is a crazy prediction as well just because of the team like what it is, it is going to be nip envy phase i mean this new look cloud nine is going to be there fanatic jesus christ <laughs> Um, it's pretty yeah, good, right? I, I, yeah. I think that's fair to G2. say. G two. Here's fuck. Are you serious? I forgot about that entirely. It's that's, mental, that's, mate. Like the actual qualifier is going to be sick. It's, it's going to be like a tier one event. Yeah. That's so fucked. Uh, yeah, I feel bad for any team that's like coming up at the moment and being like, "Oh yeah, we're in good shape heading into the qualifier." It's not going to matter. Um, yeah, they should. I, here's the thing. The scary part is this is like where they've always done bad, and like there's no yeah. there's no logical reason for it outside of just saying they they choke at the qualifiers, and that's like the scariest thing at all because like that's the hardest thing to fix is just yeah, not choking. Yeah. Talk to Astralis about that. Um, so I mean that's that's just nuts to think about because they look so good outside of it, and if they go there and just choke. It's almost like one of the things where you, you should they should be glad that they're from like a region like Brazil where there's not a lot of talent past SK and Immortals. Because I think if this was any other team that was going to their that was playing at the level they've been all year and they failed to qualify for a third major in a row, I think that's like immediate cause for like a change. Like if you can't qualify for majors. No, I, I mean, I agree with you on that level. Like, oh, it depends. Okay, here's the thing. Okay, it depends what the extenuating circumstances are. So, for example, let's say somehow you got into E-League and you won E-League. Okay, at that level, if you're being so successful at non-major tournaments, 
Like yeah. you might have an extreme case for it, but I agree. Let's say they're at the level they're at now, and they just keep bombing majors. You're probably right. You do have to do something about it. Like you'll notice, even though I still think Existence is an incredible in-game leader, one of the best of all time, I still would put him in a French team. I absolutely acknowledge that he is the only thread that runs through all those failures at the yeah. offline quarterfires for the majors uh, at the majors themselves rather than a group stage, because basically everyone else left, came back, and went had success elsewhere. And he's the only one who didn't. So I acknowledge there's clearly something mentally going on there, and there's clearly something about his approach when it came to that specific tournament, you know. Now, with that said, here's the question then. So it's not like Immortals are identical to the team I was talking about before GVN, because they did make the change for Showtime to Zeus. Did it was it noticeable? Was there anything you observed? Um, I thought the tactical adjustments were. I mean, that that's one of the things that I thought. Like even in their loss, like I mentioned against Cloud Nine on Train, even in their loss, I think they outplayed Cloud Nine overall. They lost every single one on one. I think there were like four or five of them in that game. They lost every single one to Cloud Nine uh, in those one on ones. And if a single one goes their way, they win it. But tactically, they looked better. Uh, the tactical adjustments mid game looked better. Um, and when were really really effective, and even even Zeus, um, you know, he wasn't like blowing up the scoreboard or anything, but he actually I think he top fragged for them on the deciding map of the grand finals against Cloud Nine. I think he was tied with Henny for like top fragging, um, so he had a great individual level, all things considered. All like him coming back so recently to actually yeah. playing. I think that was his first tournament since 2007. He told me. Okay. Um, so I mean that that's pretty sick for him to come back and, and be one of the leading players in the third map. Um, I think with time and with more of his tactical input and you and you'd know. I mean this is where you mentioned earlier you thought Fallen maybe was doing some callings from earlier in the year. Well this is where you know um, Zeus is going to bring some of the same same mindsets on how to play certain situations in certain maps and how to develop this team and how it operates in mid rounds. So I mean that'll be cool to keep our eyes on uh, for for the immortal side, and that can only benefit them. Um, so a little bit more time, and I think this is, I mean, this is already a scary team, definitely in North America, probably uh, Europeans as well, but I think, I think, I don't think they've hit their ceiling yet by any means. I think Zeus coming in is going to be really, really cool to see how high they can get once they get some more in-depth tactics, uh, and especially someone with experience on the big stages to help with, help with, you know, collapsing. Okay. So a couple of the other teams that we're going to talk about, Cloud9 Heroic, we can talk about them in a minute because they were at the next tournament. So we no need to yep. blow a load on that one now. So I just want to yeah. talk about instead, the team I want to ask about was actually Optic because obviously they were the team where they took, the, after all the blue, hullabaloo about it's going to be this player, it's going to be this player, they're like, just take the original lineup, like brilliant, okay. So they took the original lineup without Tarek, if you remember, and yep. just played with that one. And obviously they lost to Heroic who obviously are now established themselves to be a pretty good team, like above the level of most of the NA teams. Overall, what did you think of Optic? Uh, I mean, they didn't, obviously, they didn't really impress me. Um, I, I don't know, like, they've, they've never been, like, a very impressive team to me, so I don't think, I think they're pretty much right where they were. I'm, I'm more just like, I think they were, they were one of the teams, they were in that group of death that had, like, TSM and Echo Fox and actually Luminosity who couldn't make it. So here's, here's the one area of pity I actually have for Optic is because of the way that Northern Arena adjusted how that group was played when Luminosity dropped out, which was a dumb way to do it, but it's, it is what it is. Um, they actually probably got screwed um, probably, like, the second hardest of, of all the teams there. To where on the first day it got changed from the from the from the GSL group style to BO3 round robin with those three teams, yeah. and they set up on the first day at like 10:30 or 11 in the morning, and I don't think they got finished with their second BO3 until like 11 to midnight or some, something like that. They were playing literally all day and just sitting through all those delays. So I mean, there's some extenuating circumstances I think in that situation for them, um, but but overall, I mean. It's nothing new. Yeah, they, we, we, we knew that team, and there was a reason why that team made changes. It's because they weren't happy with the results, and I don't think they could have left this event being happy with the results or their um, or with their lineup situation, which I don't even think they know what's going on at the moment. Yeah. Because obviously that's a team where, looking forwards, we want to see what happens when they do get Tarek in the lineup. Now, what was the actual final word on that? Like, it is just apps out now. Is that the actual final word on that? They, I don't even think they've come out with a final word yet. Okay. That's like that's kind of like the final word of what everyone is thinking. But they they haven't said they have said absolutely nothing. Um, so I don't know. Maybe it's a situation where maybe Daps is going to be coaching. I I have I couldn't even tell you. Um, they played some they played some decent series against TSM, obviously beating them. But I mean they got they got crushed by Echo Fox. 69, 68, which can't be good. But it's just like hard to attribute this, right? Because that is the old lineup, and Tarek is going to be a big piece of the lineup moving forward. So, I mean, it's, it's kind of like take whatever positives you can. 
He's going to be a big piece of something, that's for sure. So, <laughs> on that note, we will now move to the next line, which was obviously Star Series. Oh, no, actually, before we go to that, Wizzles do Ely, do it chron- chronologically. So, we had the Ely European qualifiers. Uh, not qualifiers, preliminaries. Preliminaries. Remember, this is season two already. My lawyer has advised me to state that <laughs> this is season two, Moses. But it's all online. It's like random TV. It's the banner says season two, preliminaries underway. So, okay, in the European preliminaries, essentially they played from like 16 teams down to four. And then those four teams are now in the offline portion of, of season two. So I got all the terminology there. I got it all correct, Moses. <laughs> Did you have that written down on like a cue card? I'm just coming up with it as I go, mate. So <laughs> in general, nothing was too crazy because the whole thing about an online match like that to me is it doesn't matter how, what the score is, what maps you win on. You just have to win the game, qualify, get to the land, and who gives a fuck what you did online, right? So yep. for most people, that's what it was like. So even though people like, for example, G2 had like really close series against King Win, and then fucking like Gambit and Dignitas was really close. It doesn't matter as long as those teams, yep. the favorites, win the game. But then the one that was really, really bizarre was this Attacks versus God Sent match because Alternate Attacks won the series and it was a full three map series. Like this is the, the crazy thing. Okay, so it's one thing if Attacks wins map one. Map one was Dust 2, okay. Obviously, first of all, Dust 2, not only one of the most famous upset maps in the history of all Counter-Strike versions, but even more so, it's always been extremely famous throughout all versions of Counter-Strike. Their German teams, for some bizarre reason, are always good on Dust 2. It's always one of their best maps. So it's one thing if you lose that one. But when you consider the next two maps were Overpass and Cash, and so you're playing three full maps against this team, it seemed like surely Godsent is going to win the series overall. You know, you can get upset once, but two out of three the better team should win. What do you think about the fact that Godson didn't manage to qualify here and, and added to that, obviously, has basically bombed everything. They bombed all their online matches recently and they even bombed Star Series. Yeah, they they have, uh, they're looking very lackluster, aren't they? I mean, this was like that exciting change. I think, I mean, honest, as, as silly as it sounds, or maybe not even that silly, I, you put it great on the desk, you were just like, man, that, that Olaf Meister is a really good player. <laughs> I think they really are just starting to realize how much they were able to get away with because they always had him as a safety net. Yeah. Like, I think that's the, I think that's the start of the realization. Um, that doesn't mean I don't, I, I think that this decision to make this team was necessarily a bad one. I'm glad that they're going to be under Prodax again. Um, I just think if you're, if you're going to switch to that tactical style where, where Prodax is going to be calling everything, especially from the system they ran for over a year being successful with it, it's going to take a little bit more time, but surely... Um, this is this is kind of a, a big low point for them. Um, so I mean, I guess I, I guess it all the de- just so disappointing, you know. I, I wanted this team to be an E League. Um, I think what's crazy about it is the fact that Godsent was the ones who picked us too, for all the reasons you just said. Godsent yeah. was that was their map, uh, and they got they got smacked on it. Um, and I think that was that was the biggest shock about it because I think especially with an online match, considering Godsent is playing from Ukraine where they were at Star Ladder, I think I. Could, like if this, I still would have been surprised by alternate attacks winning, but I, like I expected it to at least be closer. But the fact that they got spanked on Dust 2, 16 to seven, uh, and then lost cash 16 to eleven, which is um, not not a huge blowout, but like is not necessarily a close match. Um, I think that's um, I think that's really disappointing. That's actually kind of frightening for this team. Because here's the thing, I've been thinking a lot about Godset recently and all these bad results they've been having. Now, it's funnily enough, when I made my video about the, the roster swap between Fnatic and Godsent, I think I was one of the only people who actually looked at it and went, I think, I, I think Fnatic's got the better end of this deal, you know, because I looked at it like, okay, in Fnatic, I don't know what the composition will look like. I don't know how the team play will work or what maps they'll be good on, but they've got enough aimers here that they should at least be good, okay? Yeah. Whereas I looked over at the Godsent side and I was like, okay, nearly all the reasons that everyone should be thinking this is a good team are just based on history. It's all just based on like, well, when they played a year ago together or when yeah. they played two years ago together. Now that's all well and good, but it doesn't actually count for anything. Like you can't, you can't cash out the bank, you know, whereas the difference is raw aim right now, you can cash in, you know, you're going to get a certain amount from that, you know. So here's the crazy thing about Godsent, the more I think about it. Part of the reason why it fucks with your brain to think that Godsent is this bad at the moment is because you think this way, okay, Everyone thinks of it from the crims angle, okay? This is the way I'm going to describe it. <clears throat> Everyone thinks to themselves, right, yeah, but think about it, Thorin. Remember, crims, JW, Pronax, and Flusher were four of the five members of the best team ever. They were the team that won all those tournaments in 2015. They were super sick, right? So if you think from that angle, it's inexplicable how they can have these problems right now, okay? But here's the other way to think about it, okay? Not from the crims angle. 
You think about it from the Schneider angle. So you go, okay, yeah, but Schneider, Pronax, JW and Flusher were four of the five members of that Fnatic team that won DreamHack Winter and then gradually went downhill and then bombed out of group stages at DreamHack Summer and then had to literally cut the team in half and then bring in these guys called Crimson Olaf to, to reboot the whole franchise. Yeah. So you know what I mean? Those, If you, do, if you think of it from those two different perspectives and fall somewhere between the two, you kind of get the team you've got now. Now, not as extreme as that, obviously. I still thought they'd be getting into lands and, you know, being group stages and stuff but, yeah but the whole point i'm making is when you take out olaf meister i mean it'd sound like a pretty sweet it'd sound like a joke if i said to you last year okay i'm gonna make a new team moses uh what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna take this fanatic team you know that olaf meister like best player in the world like dominates every land just gonna take him out the team but probably should still be good though probably still be all right yeah you'd be like yeah yep yeah, sounds fine yep yeah, should be all right like I, that's the one part you can't take out you, you absolutely cannot take that piece out of that mix well, and even even like look like you yeah all the aimers, but you even look at Godson right now like they what who's the star player on this team? I think that's the big thing is these these identities. I mean yeah they have they're they're basing it off the off the past is like Flusher, Crims, JW they all had their moment as like the best player in the world or like one of the most dominant players sure, yeah. of their little mini eras. Yep. Um, Crims Crims has fallen asleep. Uh, Crims especially in that alternate attacks match. I don't remember the last time Crims had a phenomenal game, uh, and and he's looking very very pedestrian at the moment. Uh, JW, we I mean his he he self admittedly has even said he's not at a great level right now, and he's that's what he wants to get back to. So he's not going to be the one. Uh, Pronax just we know he's not going to do it just from all the in game leading, all the other attention spent. So Flusha and Schneider have to do it, and Flusha I mean yeah. It's gonna be great, but you need more than that. I don't expect Schneider to be to be the top star next to Flusher to be the secondary badass on this yeah. team. Um, so I mean that that's the question. Is yeah, Fnatic did get all the firepower, and and everyone kind of expected this kind of rejuvenated the that three man core to come over to Godsend and just be like and just get back to it. And I think it's taking longer than even they expected for them to find that form. Um, but yeah, I, I like Crims in that alternate attack series. Just I'm just because I have the stats up right now, fifty nine ADR, like. That's that's insane. That's so bad. You're not going to win many games. He's supposed to be like, that's supposed to be. He's not supposed to get all the kills, but he's the impact player. You know, he is that guy who can lock down a bomb site all on his own. And if he's only getting 60 ADR in the in the match, locking down a bomb site, uh, you're not going to win very much that way. Yeah, well, I mean, this is the concern then, isn't it? Because <clears throat> if you look historically, Crims was the guy where as soon as Olaf had the injury and left the line, the starting lineup, he's the guy who just fell asleep. He just he absolutely went off a yeah. cliff and he, he never really fully returned. Like He came back for the odd game since Olaf Meister came back in the lineup. But if you remember the way the end of Fnatic was, the storyline went like this. Olaf Meister came back and had like a little bit where he was, he was on form again. You were like, he's pretty good again. And then Dennis actually took over at the end as the best player. So what's funny is Fnatic retained yeah. the best act player Dennis and then the guy who not that long ago had been the best player so in terms of the star power they kept it all in Fnatic on the side of the guys who are now in Godsend you look at it and here's what's funny at the moment Flusher probably has been the best player in their team but that's also the downside because if you remember the team I'm talking about from 2014 the one that was at the end of that era when they had Devil Walk and Schneider and they had to cut those players and go into this Flusher uh, Olaf Meister uh, Crim's era what's funny is at the time Flusher was the best player in that team and in fact he was still very good actually even when they were really dropped off but his style of play is not the kind that is like hard carry style because the whole, whole thing is he is like a lurker he wins clutch rounds he kills people on eco rounds like it's not really the style where it's gonna like take over a whole game and win you matches so unfortunately I'm not even sure that's that great a style matchup and so when, when we try and yeah. figure out who the star player is gonna be that's my issue entirely is like I think okay so here's the thing I know Flosher can be the best player on this team I know he can be a very good player actually by the way if you take away all of my etc my, my, my downplay of Flusher was never that he wasn't a good player it's that I never understood this world in which people were telling me he was better than Olaf Meister when Olaf Meister was like the best player in the world you know I always thought that was like a stretch too far and also when you play with an Olaf Meister you're getting help there okay <laughs> you can't deny that so here's the yeah, problem yeah it gives you put Flusher now sure he can be the best player my problem is who is the second best player because at the moment if you look historically at JW he's at his best when he's in that kind of like streaky style Makaleli fucking Chris J like if you put if you have those guys as your third best player they can do a lot for you they can have huge impact halves but if they have to be consistent their entire style of play is not consistent like they, even their mentality is not consistent in terms of how they're going to approach the game their decision making for these players is, is pretty poor so it's basically for me Godsent has to have Crims be the second best player and right now Crims is terrible and so uh, there's, there's a lot of problems in this team and that's that's a key one for me because without firepower I mean this is something we found throughout history 
without firepower, you can have the best tactics in the universe. You can make every read correct. You will not win the game, even against a team like FaZe. Yeah. Um, and now we're, now we're at a situation where they don't have the firepower and they can't even qualify for anything. This is, I mean, this is going to be really frightening. I'm trying to figure out if there's, if Pronax can even do it, if he can actually make this team work. Because I'm, I'm like just even looking at the pieces and the level they're at right now. I think this team has got, you know, a good four or five months before we see them actually challenging to challenging some of the top teams right now. I don't think this team is, uh, is in the top ten whatsoever. I don't even think it's close. Like what's funny is I don't know if you saw this, but when they formed this team, maybe a day or so later, I made kind of a bold prediction on Twitter. I actually said. I don't think Fnatic or Godsent wins a tournament. I think I said like the next eight months or something. I said it was it was a pretty solid prediction. Okay, and what's funny is I can't remember who it was. It might be Flush or JW. Someone made some sort of comment like, "Oh yeah, lol," you know, like implying they would. But here's the thing: the Godsent side of things, I think they're a million miles from winning a tournament. And the Fnatic side of thing is more like, first of all, you got Wenton, so it's not you're going to be. It's, you haven't got an all star team. Let's just establish that. And then secondly, at the moment, until we see what they play like, they just look like a, a phase type team. You know. Like, a lot of aimers who want to play loose, but they have none of the team play aspect. So to me, both teams are in trouble, but Godsent particularly, I don't know where they're going. Because if you think about it, the only tournament Godsent have in their back pocket right now is the next major because they got the spot. So they're in the next major at least, whenever that is, presumably yeah. early next year. But that's it. At the moment, they're fucked for all the leagues. Remember, they're not in EPL. They've got they've got almost nothing, Moses. Like They can't even qualify yeah, no, for they- shit. It's crazy, right? It's so it's so bad right now. That, that I mean that that is exactly it. They're so fortunate they have that major, or else they would they would have be having a very boring six month stretch of where they're not involved in anything, which is so hilarious in a really sad and depressing way. I'm just trying. I mean, this is both teams seem to have like they. I mean, they they have like. I almost want to say they have like the, the opposite strengths, and then like the, obviously the opposite weaknesses—the firepower versus the tactics in that yeah. sense. But even even Godson doesn't even have the tactics right now because Pronex, um they, they've had some good T sides overall, but I mean it's nothing flashy, and it's it's just kind of just basic stuff and good trading. Um, but no matter how good the tactics are going to be that Pronex comes up with, no matter how good his mid round calls, if they're not putting damage and kills on the board, it's not going to matter. So, I mean, I almost, I'm not even sure what the strength of Godsend as a team is right now, because you would want to just say it's, they have Pronex. That is like the shining star. Now they can go back to the very strategic style, the very smart and intelligent style that we didn't see them playing in Fnatic, but they don't even really have that because it's not going to be effective. They're in a, they're in a scary spot. I, I think this team is, uh, is very, very, very uh, weak at the moment, obviously. Oh, absolutely. So, okay. If we get that... What do you actually think, though, as a last topic on the on the E-League qualifier, what do you actually think of alternate attacks, the fact that they will actually be at the offline portion of this competition? <laughs> I can't... Uh, I... They're, I think they're gonna. I mean, like most most new teams that get stepped up to the to the big leagues. I think the old term in, in one point six was "Welcome to the Pros, bitch." Um, yeah. I think they're gonna show up in Atlanta yeah. and just get stomped. Classic. Like, by the way, yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, I'll tell everyone. Island. I'll tell everyone this anecdote because it's, it's actually brilliant. This is what I've always loved about Americans was that Americans, obviously, I mean, by the way, there's a, there's a natural bias, which is that in the early days of Counter Strike, since people didn't go to a lot of international lands, obviously, people from Germany and people from Sweden might not have fantastic English, so there's not going to be much back and forth anyway in a game in, in world say, okay. But all the Americans obviously are playing in American leagues, and so there was a famous. Uh, standard set right where what you would do was say you were playing in an online game and say it was like a cal game which is the equivalent by the way of like epl or something say you're playing in an important match and then you're doing really well and let's say for example you win like a 1v2 and just wreck the other team completely what you would do is you would type in world say welcome to the pros bitch or something along those lines and it basically just meant like you know like like you're just like an amateur that just got to this level like i'm like the vet like suck my dick basically and so it was actually glorious moses wasn't it? it was used so many times in history <laughs> it was it was like a, a, a hallmark of the north american scene i loved it myself mate i thought it was the shit that's the that's the best line ever welcome to the pros bitch yeah uh yeah you just you just mentally wreck people but on the subject of alternate attacks yeah, I think they're just going to come in, and I don't think I don't think they're going to do very good. And I know that's. Um, that, I mean, <laughs> I just I can't get that clip of uh, of of Kiev out of my head. <laughs> I've been like replaying it a million times. So that I mean, that's I think that's going to be the excitement is, is seeing the the stars of uh, 
the stars, the, the guys that showed up, the Kiev, the KZY, uh, Kazuya, I think James said he's supposed to be pronounced. Uh, like those guys um, were dominant in this in this series against against Godson. So obviously you want to see them show up. And I think even DDK, bless his heart, made a really good point when we did the E League Extra show where he said maybe this team isn't going to be good, but maybe maybe the product of this team is they come in and maybe it's like Kiev shows up and he's incredible on land. Um, the team itself doesn't do well, but that's just a piece that gets you know picked apart by by some other org comes in and they. Need Need to make a change. Maybe Mouse Sports in the future says we need to, we need an okay. upgrade. Let's go for yeah. Keith. He had a great E League season. Okay. Did he care? Ever the optimist there? Maybe they go to LAN and actually one of them <laughs> isn't total shit, and they all just gets ripped apart completely, and then we never have to hear from them again. But he can just play for a good team that I like. I am DDK. Brilliant. Yeah, okay. Now, the org's just like, wait a minute. What? What was the good news? Oh, good news for the player. Bad news for you. You will lose any of your players. Or, or they all cheat. So <laughs> brilliant. Yeah. What I don't know why uh, DDK yeah. Consulting never took off that agency that he started, you know? <laughs> <laughs> if you're ever wondering why DDK yeah. does not have his own job, it works for Face It, it's because yeah. of that. Why not? So, okay. I, I don't know. Like, I, I'm trying to, like, I don't think, I don't see any, I mean, obviously, we don't see this too much in land. I think the big worry, obviously, is that we just saw them at Global Challenge, where they, they barely beat Ents, who had not to playing for Alu, 16 14 win. Um, they lost to MK in the grand finals. Um, I think they lost to Penta in a BO3, and they beat Echo Fox. Was like well, their their big win. Them and them and Ents, which again, Echo Fox and Ents are listen, big wins in BO ones. Yeah, I beat Echo Fox. Listen, get a number and get in line, motherfucker. There's a lot of people be. You know that thing in Wins World where they go to get into the backstage area and then his Wins girlfriend's gone through and he goes, hey, hey, hey wait, can I come through? And the guy goes, excuse me, sorry, like IDs only. And he goes, no, but my girlfriend's through there. And that guy goes, listen, there's a lot of people's girlfriends through there. That's how I feel when someone says, yeah, but I beat Echo Fox. Like, listen, a lot of people beat uh, yeah, Echo Fox. It, it, so, that's a claim to fame. It is, isn't it? It's mad. Oh, but... I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't see this team doing very well. I, that's, that's what's so mad. That's, and that's where I think this is, uh, this is going to be an extra pressure added onto Godset. Is these motherfuckers have been dominating all of Counter Strike for like eighteen months. Yep. And they just come in, they just roll into this online qualifier and just get bodied out of the server by alternate attacks. And then they've got to just sign off that and be like, oh well, well shit, <laughs> this, this feels like hell. Oh, people like, forget. How times have changed, dude. Even online, Fnatic one of the only teams that just defied. Like you know, you can you know you can be like Virtus Pro this year, be pretty decent online, but just be terrible online. Fnatic even online used to still just like almost like uh, just like it's almost like they could just do whatever they wanted and still qualify for every line no matter what anyway like they never ever had any yep. they never had a shocking time where they didn't make an offline final or something and then you have to remember in Fnatic itself with like the Crims era. They never once finished below top eight. And the two times they did were a couple of the majors. Otherwise, they were always top four. And remember, like, this last E-League, they weren't in the best form. They made the final. So you have to realize yeah. they've been living this crazy charmed life. That's why I made that tweet where when someone noted that this was the first time at Starladder, I think it was, actually, where they hadn't even made uh, top eight of a LAN, I just put a tweet that was like, you know, welcome to the, re the world the rest of us live in, like... Like, you do realize what a mad life you've been living for the last year and a half, where it's like, oh, oh I did a really bad tournament, Mom. Oh, what happened, son? Only oh, made the semi finals. Oh, better luck next time. <laughs> yeah, you know how many sick players in Counter Strike have gone out in like group stages, fucking banged out in last place like Virtus Pro did just now? They are, unfortunately, people like JW and Olaf at JW and Crims. That's why, as harsh as it sounds, you really do have to wake up tomorrow and realize. Olaf Meister isn't walking through that door anymore. You have to do it now. And that's going to be pretty hard like it is for everyone else in history when they're not on the best team of all time. Yeah, that's that's going to be a harsh wake-up call uh, for them as well. I mean, that, that'll be interesting to see how they go, overcome that. I'm not sure. There's, I mean, there's obviously no way to fill their shoes, right? So, like, even... I don't even think as an individual player as the level that we saw Crims hit when he was the best player in the world or JW when he was the best player. I don't know if they have anyone who can even fill the shoes the way that that Olaf did. I mean, that was a guy that you could be down two, two on five in, like, some fucking crazy situation and you always feel like Olaf is going to turn it around and bring it into a two on two for you or something, something nuts. So... Yeah, that's gonna be fun. I mean, even when they even when they brought in Dennis, they went on that seven event win streak. Six. And like that that is the crazy thing about Fnatic is like they 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 you never felt like they were supposed to win any of those events. And they still did. What was it we did at the major when it was like them versus FaZe and we were like I have no logical reason for it was G two when Fnatic they were win, playing on train. Yeah. Yeah, G two. I have no logical reason. It was reason the worst for, map for Fnatic yep. to 
And but we know they're going to. You just yep. can't explain it. And they did. No That's exactly what they did. <laughs> they did exactly that bullshit of like, well, sorry, I uh, listen, listen, G two. I know you're really, you're actually pretty good on train, and I know you've actually played much better than we are right now. And I know that Smiths is playing pretty well. Meanwhile, actually, Olaf's having a pretty off game. But unfortunately, three years ago in a. Uh, a bizarre market in Agrabah. I actually found a, a cursed monkey paw and I made a wish that I get the winning counter strike for two years, but then I have to go to Godsent and be shit forever. So I haven't gone to Godsent yet, so things are fine, aren't they? Ha ha ha. We beat you G2. And then after the tournament, Pronax is like, You are now in Godsent, Flush End. Flush like, No! I never I never even thought it could happen. No! And then now he's screwed forever. And then he just looks over and the last finger on the cursed monkey paw just closes up and it's just a fist. And there's nothing left. There's no more wishes left, Moses. The cursed monkey paw. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I went deep on that one, man. Okay, anyway, so... You went really deep. So... Because obviously, look at Flush's face. Only fucking black magic is making this guy win like 700 to Get the fuck out of my face. <laughs> yeah, get out of my... Like, you know when people say, Moses, oh, you, the media should really stop saying that gamers aren't like athletes and then they'll always like do some mad bias thing. Like, look at the classic 2013 very games where they're all like fucking clean cut like models, like fucking heroin chic look going on. Yeah, but then we have also got people like JW and fucking Flusher. Look over at Flusher over there. He looks like he should be fucking wrestling pigs like he's not some fucking mad athlete is he can we get can we get back on side you can't also be sick at video games and just be a mess in real life like <laughs> anyway so on that note skip the god set we'll move on moses i won't bring you into that section it was that don't don't yeah, get yeah. tarnished with the same feather as me or whatever same brush so okay here's the other question i have for you <sighs> you ready so we're talking now about star ladder and at Star Ladder, we had a pretty good tournament. Like, it's funny because a, a lot of the teams obviously bombed the tournament. It's one of those scenarios where it makes it look, if you look at the playoffs, like if someone looks at the playoffs, okay, they'll go, let me have a look. Cloud9, Flipside, Astralis, Envious, Heroic. Ding, ding, ding. This must be a pretty weak tournament. Not, well, no, they had VP and Na'Vi. They just got banged out in the fucking group stage, didn't they? This was a strong tournament on paper. Yeah, this is a, I mean, a really, really strong tournament on paper, um, and that's that's the incredible part of, of whatever. I think I think most of this tournament just kind of, I think we, we see there's a couple different effects. I think we see it play one. I think it's so cool than Counter Strike how so many so many of these teams can win these events now. It's not just like how it was two years ago when it was going to be like a Fnatic and Nip like a, the, one of the French teams. Um, th like there's 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 a very deep deep pool of teams that can just one off have a sick run in a tournament they're not going to be the dominant teams for months but like at any one tournament you can have a team hit this level where they go all the way to the finals and they just win it um i mean you could have seen uh, you know astralis was looking good there for a bit before they kind of did the classic astralis um cloud nine i thought looked uh, looking at the quarterfinals and they drew flip side you were like all right they're going to pretty much be in the semifinals. Yeah. um and, and you know good things for them there they can make it as well uh even heroic with the way they've been playing dignitas the danish teams you thought that some of them and then g2 obviously uh and then i think the other one is i think it'd be interesting to know i don't think there's ever a way to like actually measure this obviously but I mean, this is pretty early after that. Uh, I mean, this is a month after that pl the the player break, that two weeks off at the beginning of August. So now we're seeing these teams come back in, these teams that were struggling. That like before this event, we probably wouldn't have said that they were going to do that. Great, Astralis was looking bad. Um, we had NIP who was in a Dignitas little bit of a slump. Dignitas obviously now. not that great. What's that? Dignitas hadn't been that great. Yeah, yeah, and then out of this player break, they they all of a sudden. I mean, heroic. Where the fuck did they come from? Like, the, like this Valdi guy is is sick. Uh, <coughs> so that's now a very scary team. So you have all these. Like now we're seeing the effect of this player break. These guys have some time off to recharge. Maybe go over some things. You know, if they're making roster changes, they get to actually have some time to introduce them before they throw them into the fire. Uh, and I think that was. A, I thought that was a very big effect. Um, I'm just my biggest surprise isn't Virtus Pro because I think Virtus Pro naturally is just a very up and down team. It's Navi. Everyone thought this was going to be like yeah. an insane team, sure. and I still do think they will be. But like, what the hell happened? Yeah, here's the thing. Okay, whenever you get a brand new team like this, like obviously this is very different from the Godsent scenario because some of these players right now are amazing. We know Simple's insane. We know Flame is still a very skilled player. You go through the lineup; nearly all these guys are still very legit players. So obviously this shouldn't happen that they can go out in a group stage, especially not that group stage. Like they had no one in that group who, for Navi, should have been legit scary. Like there's no there's no world champion in that group with them. They're supposed to be the world champion. So here's the weird thing, okay, about a team like this is that when they bomb the first event so bad like this you're normally supposed to say 
right, you know what, I've got away with one here. So I'll just jump immediately off the hype train and say, you know what, maybe this isn't going to work out. You know, maybe Simple doesn't mix with it or maybe lacking the in-game leader, not being able to have Starix calls, the problem. It's very easy right now to just go, you know what, I don't want to like be the guy who bets on them for the first three tournaments and they bomb. I'll just get out now. But actually, I'm doubling down. Like, as bad as this tournament was... Yeah. I, I don't know how it's hard to explain because obviously you thought this would be a team out the gate that should be very strong. Like I thought to myself, with SK not there, Navi's probably the team that should win the tournament. They've got this sick lineup. I still think that they are going to figure it out. I think there's so much talent in this team. I think they are going to be amazing. I, 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 uh, admittedly, very bad they, start. <laughs> did this did this tournament allow coaches or did it did it use the new valve rules? I think it allowed Do you. Know? I think you were allowed to use coaches. Well, was it like the valves where they can could they talk? I think you're allowed to just talk whenever you want. They don't enforce valve rules, I think. Okay, because that that would be interesting to know if like because I mean that was the big that was the big question mark about Navi coming into after the player break, right? Was once that valve coaching rule came down, we all knew Navi was going to be one of the team's hardest hit by this with Starix. So it would be kind of interesting to know how much of a see if we could find out how much of an impact Starix actually. Um, had at this tournament, if he was even calling, if maybe they they didn't they had him sit out just because they need to get adjusted for the majors if they want to get a head start on that. Sure, that would be kind of curious because I, I mean I think that that's maybe a sign of how much impact he actually had on the mid rounds. Um, that that's one of the biggest reasons I can think for them to kind of fumble this this badly, you know. Yeah. What do you think going forwards though? Of Navi, uh, I'm, I'm. I wouldn't say um, I'm super worried in any way. Um, I, I, the big thing is just going to be monitoring simple. I think uh, to me, that's still like the biggest factor. Is is he going to have one of his explosions? Is he gonna? Is that going to be? Is his attitude going to come into play? Um, that would be. I still think they're going to be fine in the long run. I just it's the big question is how how long is it going to take for them to recover from coaching and how long is it going to take for them to to find a way to keep simple happy with him being able to do what he wants to do with all this extra talent around him. Cuz he gets away with he got away with a lot in his previous teams cuz he was the fucking he was the sole badass. Got away with it liquid because he was the sole badass and like the dominant personality. But in Navi, I mean these guys are all to winning and being in top fours, it's not just going to be like, yeah, sure, simple, whatever, whatever you say. If he's like, hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna opt this route, and then you have Guardian sitting next to you, like it doesn't work. So, I mean, that'll be that'll be kind of the interesting thing to see how they continue to fit him in and, and what he, what kind of style he brings in. Sure. So, what do you think about the fact that Virtus Pro just went out in last place after the, obviously the big success of like top four, the major, then the win E League outright? Um. I don't I don't I don't think anything of it. I like I don't I don't know what to You know it's fine. it's just the, the my initial thought about it was just laughing it off and, and I I don't I don't know. It's just this team is just always like that. Like I it's it's a bit of a bummer because you want to see this team with consistency because I think they are one of the most exciting and the coolest teams to watch as a spectator and as a fan. Um, but this is this is the Virtus Pro that we have this year. It's the one that's either like very very bad or very very good. And outside of the major, outside of E League, they haven't been good at all this whole year. So I mean, this doesn't this doesn't surprise me too much. Um, I mean, it surprises me that they're knocked out, but it doesn't surprise me that they just have a bad performance. This is just. I, honestly, I'm, I am a little bit disgusted, if I'm going to be honest. I think you can tell. I don't even really know what to say. I'm a little bit shocked by it. I haven't. Uh, these are games that I didn't really actually watch myself because I wasn't able to. Um, I've just kind of looked over the stats and haven't gotten to the VODs yet. Um, but this, this, is, uh, this is obviously very, very weak from a team that just wins E-League. Uh, that, that's, this is a steep drop. This is also why, on the flip side of that whole narrative of like, oh, they're all best friends and they keep the same five-man lineup and haha, oh, now that they've won E-League, isn't every other team in history an idiot for ever kicking a player? Well, this is also what happens. You can come last place at the next tournament. You know what? Yeah. Some fantastic teams who make the shrewd decisions over and over again, they very rarely have huge bombs like you sometimes see from Virtus Pro. So that's also the crazy thing about Virtus Pro is that, unfortunately, keeping that five-man lineup... When you get th when you gr it's like you gradually distill whatever the new constellation is going to be, right? So this player can't play this role anymore. Gradually shift him over, find another player who can play that. It's like as they're gradually figuring the puzzle out, they will figure it out 
from time to time. And when they do, they win the tournament, they look super good, they finish top four, it all looks great. The problem is, it's going to be really hard to be consistent with that sort of approach because the good part about cutting people is when someone starts that dip in form, you can in theory cut them and bring in someone who's already in form. And so in a weird way, you can sometimes sort of cheat that system and not have to go through the massive downs that you sometimes get in these scenarios. And unfortunately, VP with this approach, that's what they're never going to be able to do. They have to have to ride it out, you know. What most disgusts me about this isn't their loss to Envy. Obviously, it's, it's, the, it's the Cyber Zen one, but this is the worrying part. How do they put up zero terrorist rounds on Mirage against VG Cyber Zen? I mean, that's, shouldn't, that's shouldn't be possible, right? Yeah, that's that's what's so that's what's so ridiculous about this. Uh, I mean, the fact that they were like Snacks was like a one man army, but like yeah, they they didn't really produce anything, and that's I mean they're known as that T side of team, and we just saw them steamroll people on the T sides. Um, but yeah, this this does come into this also comes into the pl fact that with with Virtus Pro, we know they've done this at different tournaments. Is they with the with the role shuffling instead of player shuffling, their in game leader like they their in game leaders go through these droughts where like they do really really good with the team for like a month or two an event or two, and then like it's like that in game leader style just no longer works, and they go to the next one. Um, so I mean, I, I, I don't even know what to think. I need to watch this vod. This this actually is very very crazy. Okay, and so one of the interesting things is that obviously in amongst all the upsets in the group stage, we had some of the teams that maybe you wouldn't have expected to, to get out of the groups get out. So for example, we had um, Dignitas got out of the group. They were in the group with Godsent. It was NIP and Dignitas got out. Uh, let's see who else. Uh, obviously Envious got out of that one. Most people probably would have picked VP over them. I don't know if anyone would have picked... Uh, the problem is Envious have looked really up and down. So I guess for that one, maybe someone would pick Cloud9 on, on current form. What do you actually think of the tournament as a whole with like, all the upsets? Like, Do you think these really are... Like the teams that won are going to be the better teams and the teams that lost are on the way down? What do you make when there's all these upsets at once, you know? Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't really... Um... So the flip side beating FaZe doesn't surprise me, but I mean I would still expect FaZe to win. I don't think the I don't think this many upsets at once is too surprising. I think we're starting to get to a point though where I think this is also a product of of these teams being able like we always scout up, right? Like when you're the when you're the underdog, sure. you're always doing more scouting onto the under the team that you're expected to beat. I, I like for instance, I highly doubt uh, for instance Virtus Pro did any scouting into CyberZen. I'm sure CyberZen looked into Virtus Pro. Um, Tai Lu had one one good upset. I mean, Navi probably didn't do too much scouting on Heroic or Tai Lu, maybe sure. Astralis. So I mean, I mean, there's that, and, and maybe it's just once again that player break where there was those two weeks off. Some of these teams did a little bit, were able to do a little bit more scouting because they were less busy coming out of things. Um, but I think we're also starting to just see like the, this improvement coming in, Dignitas coming in. Um, you know, they've taken so long now to to like actually have form. Now we're seeing it work. There were a lot of question marks about them as well with MSL, by the way. That tweet where he said, I'm not going to in-game leave the coaches, and now he's back. So that was a good event from them. I think we're starting to just see the growth. I think more than anything, it's the time of some of the really, really young players coming in, how long it actually takes for you to be able to consistently compete with the best teams. Like Magis Boy and Config, we've been seeing all year, they have these really, really good games. I think Magis Boy is starting to get a level of consistency that is very, very good for that squad. Uh, Config's getting up there as well. Care be in that lineup. Um, and then same with same with Heroic. Now we have this Valdi. We have uh, Madi in there has played very, very well. So, I mean, there's there's some really, really good uh, younger players who are finally making that next step and then being consistent with it. And I think that's kind of what we're starting to see. Okay. So, okay, in the playoffs, like, get to the good teams now, basically. <clears throat> what did you think of Cloud9's run overall? Because obviously, here's the part that's kind of harsh. If, if I only showed you a list of the teams they played and beat, it wouldn't yeah. look that sick. They basically beat Envious on a map, and then that's it in terms of impressive. Because beyond that, remember, they got to play Vici Gaming because of the upset, and then they played Flipside, who, yeah, the last major was sick, but were obviously dog shit in the last few tournaments. So then, ultimately, it looks like they just beat Envious on a map, go all the way to the semis somehow, so really easy road to the semis, and then get utterly yep. shit on by a nip. But I will give them credit. It's not their fault that Virtus Pro couldn't get to the play them, and obviously Virtus Pro was the big name in their group. It's just that, sadly, this is true, and it's just a fact, 
unfortunately getting out of a group without playing the good team in the group is not the same as playing the team in the group and then getting out you know like you, you can't get both yeah. parts of the credit so i'll give them credit for the top four you can't like take it away but it was obviously an easier top four than usual yeah especially drawing flip side um in the i mean is, remember is... that could have been let's have a look that could have been astralis uh that could have been dignitas so yeah i think getting i think getting flip side is pretty nice <laughs> they're very happy with that one. yeah i mean i'm not uh, overall uh, i mean yeah i think you, you summarize nicely top four great but i think overall very disappointed not necessarily that they that they lost to nip um but the way they the fashion, lost though was like, pretty bad right yeah they got stomped they got so, i'm like i'm actually a little bit upset i i, I stayed up to watch that game because it was like something like two thirty three in the morning my time when, sure. I, when i started watching that but like um yeah, and then you look at who is supposed to do good for Cloud9. Uh, I mean, Stewie, twenty six and thirty eight in that series against NIP. Uh, that's not gonna do. That's not doing anything. Nothing. Twenty four and thirty eight. Skadoodle, twenty three and thirty four, um, and, and like low ADRs as well. So I mean, there, there was just no production from this team. Um, and I mean, I, I just watched the Dust Two one uh, on the flight back today, and I mean, it was just it was just kind of ugly. There there wasn't there wasn't anything going for them. Um, they didn't look like that Cloud Nine that's been so dominant, and I think that's the kind of what we're seeing where they can run over with this the style they have. They can run over the North American teams, but I think this is like the big wall that they're hitting uh, against the Europeans. I think we saw Stewie's style not being very effective um, against the NIP guys. He actually had a lot of a lot of his duels with the with the uh, opponents. He he lost most of them. He beat Forrest, uh, but like when he went head to head with Get Right Exist and Mike Laley, he just got crushed by all of them. Um, so, so that style didn't really pan out, and I think that's the big thing because Stewie now has become the impetus for this team. It's no longer this team clicks as nothing does; it's now this team clicks as Stewie does. Uh, and then on top of that, you add in his in-game leading, which is still very inexperienced and new. Um, there's there's a lot of reasons why these stops, uh, you know, are so easy to happen. It was just disappointing to, to actually watch it unfold. Because I actually found the pick ban for this quite interesting. Because one thing people might not know is the format for Star Ladder is you do all the bans before the I picks. hated that format. I well, hated that format. as an NA fan, you should. Because the problem with that <laughs> format is it basically means if you're the superior team, if you really wanted to, I mean, not everyone's going to do this. You could just literally remove their best maps, both their best yep. maps. Now, obviously, here's the thing. The downside for Cloud9 is Nip already banned Mirage anyway, and that's one of the best Cloud9 maps at the moment, so that was going to be out anyway. But the interesting part is, Nip actually chose to remove Train as well, because that's been a map that's been pretty decent for Cloud9 with the automatic inclusion. And obviously, yeah. now listen, Nip was pretty good on Train not that long ago, but they would decide, right, we'll take the hit from this. And the interesting part about the pick ban was, Nip themselves picked Dust 2. Now, in, in the Slemmy era of Cloud9, Dust 2 had become one of the better maps, but Nip at the moment, they're going like super all in on Dust 2. Like that's one of the maps they want to play. So I already could see from the pick ban, like this is going to be fucking, this is going to be ugly for Cloud9 because they basically have to win. I mean, they picked Cobblestone. That was actually interesting to me because yeah. they chose to remove Nuke, remove Cash. Now, okay, remove Nuke's one thing if you scare the opponent picks it or you just don't want it to be possible for the third map. But what do you think about picking Cobblestone as their map? Uh, I can I can kind of understand it from from their point of view. I, I think I'm not a huge fan of it, obviously, especially because NI, the NIP once threat joined became very good on this map. Uh, and even though he didn't, I, he, I don't even think he was at that event for NIP. But even without him there, they obviously have a better understanding of the map. They have all the executions that they kind of that they kind of made popular and made famous. Uh, the big thing for, for Cloud9 is uh, on, on Cobblestone, you can see like Stewie's always been really effective over towards B platform, right? Um, so, I mean, he, that, that, that's an advantage they probably thought they had is how good he's been there. Automatic and him have been so playing, or Automatic's been playing so well at the A bomb site. I mean, this is a map that they've been playing very, very well in the North American region. So, I think they're falling back on the comfort level of what they had within the region, and it just kind of backfired here, uh, which, is, which is a bummer for them. Um, yeah, overall, I mean, I just think, I, I see, I don't, if you're going to talk about the pick, pick ban phase, I don't like them removing nuke. I don't see why the underdog should ever remove nuke. That's kind of like a, the, one of the chips you have to play to play uh, chicken with. Yeah. Like, leave it in there. See if NIP's going to gonna remove it in their second ban. And if, you, if you're going to remove nuke, at least leave it to your second ban, you know? Yeah, I agree. I definitely agree on that. Like, for example, if you don't remove nuke there, remember, because Nip's the one who's removing first, if you just take out cash at that point in time, now maybe Nip has to think, well, do we really want to play Nuke if they're going to pick it some weird shit? Maybe we take that instead of Train, and then yeah. now you've opened up Train for yourself, right? 
that's like your loaded gun. They've got to, they've got to be really they've got to be uh, that that makes them think. Yeah. So I mean I think that's a little bit of a blunder on, or a big blunder actually as it turns out to be for Cloud Nine. Um, and Cobblestone, I think, is just a product of them being so good on it in the in the North American region. They played, you know, although they did just they had just lost to um, to Immortals on it just like the week before. Yep. So, yeah, maybe they saw something in those demos that they were like, oh, this is an easy fix. This is an easy solution that that we think we can do. And NIP just kind of surprises them. But um, more than anything, uh, they just you know, if you look at some of the the players that that NIP has and who played well in this match, I mean, Get Right was you know Get Right and Forest are the two leading the way. That's you know it's like the vintage NIP. So when those two are going off the way they did, um, it's going to be tough to beat them on any map. Uh, you know, Get Right was just a monster in the series. 107 ADR. That's pretty sick. But the two Cloud Nine players we have to talk about are Stewie yeah. and Skadoodle, obviously. Like Skadoodle over two maps had 43 ADR. Like, that's unacceptable for a player of his caliber. Yeah, especially with a weapon that gives you 100 damage <coughs> in one shot. <laughs> right? Um, yeah, that... This is the issue with Skadoodle, and like you know, it's it's the same old issue that I keep bringing up about him is how like how mo how immobile he is, and how like lack there's a lack of aggression, and he's just a very passive style of opera, and he gets away with it in North America, but against European teams, it is going to get exposed. You have to be willing to be aggressive with that AWP. You have to be willing to to take over the game because you know, take a map like Dusty, where we all know he's going to be playing Car. If, if flashbangs are just timed properly, which the European teams are going to do, he has no impact. It's just immediately a retake on the A-bomb site, and he doesn't even get a comfortable shot off of. Um, so he's got to be able to be more aggressive and find a little bit more success and find other ways to play because he's the easiest player in the world to scout right now. Uh, and that's his biggest knock as an opera, is like he, he doesn't do anything to improve his chances of being successful with the AWP. And then you get into this liability where, you know, when they're down 16 to 7, or when they're losing these games 16 to 7 or 69, you know, there's a run at some point where, where Cloud9 just has to buy and they have to give an op to Skadoodle, but he's not being impactful with it. So um, I, I think there's still a lot of things that Cloud9 has to work on against the European competition. Because what's so whack about Skadoodle is. The, the week earlier at Northern Arena, he has like MVP type numbers when he's only playing NA and South American competition, but you see him against Europeans and I mean, it, it's nothing. I mean, he, he's struggling to even be as good as like a world edit, you know, he's, he's actually nowhere near that caliber of what we expected, you know, a year, year and a half ago from this guy when he used to be very good as a player. Yeah, and this is, well, that's the big thing, right? Because, it, like, in July of last year, the conversation going into ESO1 Cologne was, who's the best opera in the world, Skadoodle or Guardian? And if you told someone who just started having, or started watching Counter-Strike, you know, in, in August of last year, they'd just be like, what the fuck kind of a question is that? Of course it's Guardian. And, like, th this is like, Skadoodle has done, done nothing to improve or adapt as an individual player. Um, and, and he's also, because of his pedigree at the moment, I, he's almost still uncuttable. This is, this is the big issue that, that Cloud9 has had for so long, is that they're basically a team of players that you almost consider uncuttable. Um, but none of them are performing up to their, up to their potential. Um, still a, still a, a team that, that can make this happen. They still have a lot of, a lot of, team, or a lot of talent. Um, but I mean, Stewie and, and Skadoodle have to do better at the next outing. That's that. that this can't happen again. Because what makes Cloud Nine problematic for me to get behind as a team that I think is going to go beyond this level is just when you look at the balance of the of who's in the team. They have the wackest uh, star player trio I think of any team who has a chance of being top ten in the world. Because you pick me out any other one of those teams, and I can see like this guy's very good, and then this guy's going to be stable, and this guy maybe can improve. If I look at their their trio of potential stars, they've got Shroud, one of the best aimers in North America. Almost never shows us anything offline in your against European opposition. Skadoodle, for some bizarre reason, just last six months or so, really off the boil, really having his issues. Only one who's been showing up recently was Stewie 2K. Not in this match here. Obviously, this was the worst big game of his career, pretty much. And the big problem is when I think about the balance, I actually think to tie it into an earlier conversation that this is actually part of why, to me, Cloud9 is dysfunctional because they use Stewie 2K as some sort of mad crutch where when he has good games, they have a chance. But if you look at his style of play, he probably should be your second or third best player in this team. You want because he's he plays such an aggressive style. He's he's not going to just be like a rock that every round's going to yeah. do this and get the same kills every round. That's the job of people like Shroud, like Skadoodle, who by the way have more passive playing styles. So if if Stewie 2K loses games and does well, 
It's not his fault. It's the fact that his, his his stars aren't there. So his actual impact that he he basically he would win you the game, but instead he doesn't. He just makes you look decent in losses because his other stars don't turn up to the game. And so to me, my big problem there is people keep saying that. Like again, in isolation, I agree. In isolation, how can you cut Shroud? In isolation, how can you cut Skadoodle? Problem is, how can you have both in the same team? Yeah, and you I know? think we're also I think we're also getting to the point where it's we've been having this I feel like we've had the I know you and I like in private have had this conversation for the past you know most of this year is is this kind of issue with the Cloud9 roster of who the hell are you going to cut on this team because of how big of brands and how big of star power all of them have. Um, but I think we're like when is when is the point where Cloud9 just has to say we we can't we just can't do this anymore. Will they ever get there? Cuz that's what that's what Hiko's always discussed with Cloud9. That's one of the reasons why he didn't left the team. Um, well, I mean, I'll just give you some insight because <clears throat> obviously I've observed them in League of Legends as well. And the funny thing is, for most of the history of League of Legends, they actually showed massive reticence to ever remove players. Even if a player looked like he was struggling or wasn't doing very well, they, they, gave, a lot, they gave people more chance than anyone else. Now, I will point out that in very recently, in the last sort of like year, they have started to make those big changes you need to make. Their problem is, basically, if they come to a decision point, a fork in the road, where the choice is stay with something that you know and is comfortable, but probably can't like go much further than this like you can't necessarily get to the top with it or take a huge risk and go with something totally crazy usually they don't want to make the huge risk and my problem is in league of legends they eventually did it and it's actually worked out for them in csgo that's what they're still waiting to do they've never really done that huge risk and my big problem is i don't care which one it is you've got to remove one of those two in my opinion like here's the thing if you believe that they can make it back again okay what's the odds both make it back when they're in these mad slumps for so long i would say Okay, I'll allow you the gamble. You can pick one of them that you're going to hope you can rehabilitate into being really good, right? The other one, you're going to just cut one eventually because we've got to have someone who can do something now. So I have to say, personally, if I had to pick someone, I would make it Shroud right now, actually, because it's very hard to get good AWPers. I, I actually think Skadoodles is the most obviously mental problem because he was actually at one point in time at an incredible level really consistently. Whereas if you actually look at Shroud's career, he only ever had very short blips where he was like really good against Europeans. Mainly it was just like North America. So if I have to pick, even I would go with Shroud. And I think that whole aspect of like, yeah, but his streaming presence, I think that's really overblown, mate. Guess what blows the fuck out of any streaming presence? Winning a major. Yeah, make the file of a major like Team Liquid. That's way better to me than making having some sick streaming numbers or whatever you know. Well, yeah, but well, yeah, uh, I mean, I would, I would go, I would probably pick Shroud as well. And I, I think the, I think the only reason is because offers are hard to come by, especially in North America. I think that's that's the only reason. If if there was if there was an offer that you know wasn't as like gifted or talented than than Skittle, but could have more of an impact. Because they have the players with, with Stewie and, and nothing has actually been at an insane level. When, when Stewie's playing well, nothing plays well also. They kind of really do play off each other on lock. I think Automatic's been the best player on this roster for, since he joined. Um, uh, even even better than Stewie, especially when it comes to land. I thought actually Stewie had a really tough grand finals at um, at Northern Arena as well against Immortals. Uh, but I, but I, think, I think Skadoodle is just very, very fortunate that he's an opera at the moment. Because if there was anyone who could have just an impact without like just sheer dominance... Because that's that's what Skittle is really lacking at the moment. Even if he's not going to dominate games, he, like, he, you just don't see him there. You just don't see him in some of these games. He's very very quiet uh, the majority of the time, especially against European teams. So yeah, uh, he's very fortunate that that there's there's few offers. And because yeah, I, I agree with you. Just because of that fact, I'd have to remove Shroud if I was if I was to pick between the two of them. Like I understood the argument a year a year and a half ago about Shroud, which is like at the time. Oh, there's no NA talent, right? That whole argument has been blown out ages ago because guess what? All the guys who make up the top teams now are all people who weren't top pros at the time. Automatic was on nobody's radar to join a Cloud9, etc. a year ago. You look at all the people like, I mean, obviously Stewie 2K is an obvious example, you know? No one gave a fuck about this guy. Automatic was on nobody's radar to join Cloud9 a month ago. Whenever, whenever it was. He no, but you know what I mean. Like these players, yeah. the the idea that there is no talent is right. just a self perpetuating line that people tell themselves. So I I put it this way, okay. This is another way I like to think of roster moves. I've brought it up many times. Whenever I can tell that someone's hanging on to someone for sentimental reasons, so I give you the example. I always say it to people who I know really like Nip. Okay, people who are like analysts who still think Nip can make it. I always say to them this. If you're having a hard time, like, deciding, could I cut Freiburg? Just think about this. If you cut Freiburg tomorrow, which team would rush out and pick him up? 
There is none. Like, there's no team as good or better than Nip that would rush out and pick up Freiburg. Not only that, if you were to cut him, which team would he go to and play even better than he does now and make you think, fuck, I wish I hadn't cut that guy? So here's the problem. I think the same applies to Shroud. If you cut Shroud tomorrow, right, and he goes and joins Optic or he goes and joins TSM, do you really think that magically just turns it around and becomes some super sick player and you're like, God, what was that? What was I thinking cutting that guy? No. I mean, first of all, he goes to Optic and then they say like, oh, Tarek, why aren't you wearing your... Yeah, well, it's the same joke from last week. So <laughs> you see what I'm doing there? Like, But you don't, no, you know what I mean? No, I don't think he goes to those yeah. teams and just tears it up and you regret it. You know, I think if, you, if you're being real... You're just hoping that he goes back to two years ago. It's probably not going to happen, though. If I'm, if I think, if you're being harsh, yeah, <clears throat> um, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't think anyone really. I don't, yeah, I don't. I can't see Shroud playing better for any other team that he's on right now than Cloud Nine. Um, but I think you could also, I think it, that would be interesting to see who who would rush to pick up Shroud if he was just released from his contract. That would be. Because I, I actually have Shroud very similar to Tarek in the sense that he is that same kind of like wannabe star player, but he just hasn't hit those levels yet. We know it's possible. We've seen it. He just doesn't doesn't do it frequently enough that you can rely on it. And that's that's the biggest issue. That's always been Cloud9 especially. I mean, North America as a region has suffered from it, but Cloud9 especially has always had the stars that you can't rely on. Um, and, and I think, I mean, here's the interesting thing. While we talk about young talent, I mean, you, you look at two other players on the CLG side of things, and we don't have to go super in depth, but Sub Rosa and, and Ethan all of a sudden had a very, one very good event. So uh, at Northern Arena, they both played very, very well. So, I mean, this is. Yeah, but I mean, Sub Rosa was just setting shit up, you know. He's, 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 get, he's getting going. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> just. All right. Okay, okay. <laughs> just saying. I, yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Throw them, they have their cell phones at the table, right? Tell you what, mate, when he goes to take his snaps, I don't want to take the air out of him like I was Tom Brady. References is incredibly on point. I don't even follow North American sports, mate. That's like reference game god tier. Okay, keep going. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, Cloud9 is like the one organization that's known for finding Stewie out of FPL, out of out of like Maine, essentially, out of ESCA Maine. And then I mean, <coughs> Shroud. Shroud was brought up and he, had, he hadn't really played, played one competitive season. Um, and now they're at a point where where everyone else they, they can't cut automatic anymore because he's made this team play so much better. They can't cut Stewie. The, yeah, they, this is a team. It'll be interesting to see. Where they, they're not going to make any changes soon. But I mean, they're in a, they're just always perpetually in a tough spot. It feels like. Uh, if you ignore, be, they're going to be at Bucharest. They're going to be at Bucharest <coughs> as well. So we'll we'll see if there's improvement because they're going to be boot camping and yeah, then they'll right. be at Bucharest. Here's a question for you, Moses. If you ignore all the nameplates, you don't look at who plays what role and who's on the team. If you had to pick out the type of player or the role that you think that team needs the most, what would you pick? Um, I think they need... I think more than anything they need... Um, oh, man. They need like a really, really consistent rifler just like someone who's going to put up their 25 frags i think they okay. need like I, that's that's where i'd want to see shroud replaces they need someone who's going to be able to carry from that third man in role okay so let now again forgetting contracts forgetting anything whether someone wants to play in the team who in na fits that caliber like i mean i can i, I just to start it off i would say nitro how about that yeah that's a pretty good um, one. If you want that particular good rifler, half entry. But I don't. I don't think they need any more entry power. I think Stewie Stewie does a fine job of that, and automatic is very frequently with them. That little Asian duo that they've created. Okay. Um, who, I well, think who they else do. then? Who else is out that's, there? Do you think? That's why it's so upsetting that you don't see Shroud like doing better because they have they have everything that he could have wanted. Remember when he did a little bit more of like a an entry role? He was like a little bit more of the aggressor, and he just wasn't good at it. So you yeah. felt he needed to get back in his comfort zone. He has the aggressors now. He's got automatic nothing and Stewie, and there's like Stewie and nothing especially are just three people who just want to be involved in carnage like there should be a front line there that that shroud just loves um you take out the contracts why not someone like i mean yeah nitro and elise are the two big ones that come straight to mind um even pimp if we're just going to stick with liquid let's go to no one on clg i think would fit the bill <laughs> clg in shambles right now my man yeah um optic rush isn't he more of an entry fragger though? Yeah, but I think he has the skills to to be a little bit more. I think he would be more successful with in the in the kind of role that Shroud would play. Okay, 
I think obviously, obviously Showtime, be... but uh, the only reason I wouldn't pick him up is he doesn't have good enough English. So, so. yeah, yeah, the only reason he knows the basics. Well, maybe he does. Who knows? So, listen, none of that English, Duncan. Okay, none of the Brazilians. No one English. speaks English actually. <laughs> in fact, Zeus didn't even know he was speaking English. He actually was trying to say in Brazilian something that just coincidentally sounds like if we don't, uh, if you re reset the map, I forfeit. That means. Do you really in, want to get into in, this? In Portuguese, <laughs> that actually means like, can I please have tacos with the extra chili sauce and some yogurt on it, please? He thought he was ordering lunch, and then now people are taking. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, 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 keep going. So, is there anyone else uh, who we can pick out here? I'm trying to mentally go down the list. Um, let's see. <coughs> I mean, let's let's not touch you. Let's. I won't even touch SK. You know, um, what I say here's here's my here's my comment on it. Okay, Moses, it is hard to pick out NA players, and unfortunately, NA players are the ones under all the ridiculous contracts because they all have a lot of money over there. So, here's what I would say to Cloud Nine. I think it's time Cloud Nine makes a foreign pickup. Think of all these great Europeans now. Yeah. Like, dude, like, half of fucking Dignitas and Heroic and all these teams. There's a whole bunch of solid riflers in these teams, mate. Twist and, twist and Sick from TSM. I think one of them would be cool. And as we know, obviously, C9's allowed to take their first pick of the litter of any TSM player who happens to be on the lineup. <laughs> well, I, I wanted that guy. Obviously, like, Jack comes in. I claim Prima Nocte. Bring him <laughs> with me. He's like, well, well, there's my player. You can have him when I'm done with him. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah, great. there was no fight to keep automatic. That is mad, be isn't like, it? <laughs> TSM has got to be sitting there like motherfucker. Uh, yeah, they didn't raise a finger. That's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I would love to see Cloud9 go to go to European talent. Um, what about that bubble guy that just got dropped? He's not actually as bad as you'd think because obviously the problem with that team is they've been mired by the whole dreamer thing where. Like, it seems very likely that he was cheating by the way that he was banned. And, like, I haven't seen any good evidence to say that he wasn't. Like, it was the standard thing where it's like, oh, my cousin's brother hacked the account and was like, shut the fuck up, mate. That's the worst excuse I've ever heard. But anyway, no, it, that, that's not bad. I mean, I, like I say, personally, if I were them, in this position where you've got this type of money, the downside of European players is a lot of them don't want to come to NA, obviously. But if you can find some that would, I mean... People like the ones in Heroic. There's some good players there. You can get you can get some solid people out there who... Yeah, but I think the, the Heroic's had enough success where they keep that... Like, no one leaves that lineup. Possibly, but I mean, that's the sort of thing where I'm scouting it for six months from now, right? I yeah. wait until they have a bad month and a half, and then I come in with my big offer, say, you want to come live in America, have this really great salary, play with famous players, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Live in Santa Monica, live right by the beach. Cute, cute yoga girls. Well, I think you just explained right there why their team sucks dick, mate. But okay. Actually, Cloud9 is <laughs> all right. So, okay, here's the question then. After seeing the way Cloud9 got, well, technical term is banged the fuck out by Nip, mm -hmm. where does this actually place them now then? Because obviously you're riding the hype train pretty hard up until that point, but that's a massive wake-up call, right? A team with a stand-in wrecks you 2-0. Yeah, uh, I, I had them, what, like, uh, I mean, I don't think they're... Th I, that's what's crazy is I think they actually... Did they they gained points on the top ten of HLTV, didn't they? Who knows how that works, mate? They're fifth now in the world. On HLTV's what's that from? ranking, who yeah, the what's fuck that? knows? Probably because they use online results as well, and they use I don't know. Okay. Fucking, who cares, mate? Keep going. <laughs> um, <coughs> yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't have them in the top ten. They're not. They're not in top ten. Okay. I mean, for as for as good as they've looked, uh, I mean, you you got to have the results on land to back it up. Um, and, and yeah, it does. I think this is one of the areas in which in which it does. I, I mean, obviously, I don't know how those rankings are done exactly with with HLTV, but it's like we said earlier, where if you if you look at yeah, they placed top four at, at Starlighter, that looks fantastic. Um, but then if you go through who they actually beat, it's like ah, okay, that's not yeah. that cool. Um, it it actually is just funny though that Cloud Nine gained three points and Immortals lost three points. In these in these standings, um, I would have them, especially because I just did those. I would have them third in North America. I would have the two Brazilian teams first and second. I would have them right above Liquid. Okay, probably. Um, yeah, I'd probably say like once again, it, it's kind of similar to Immortals. I think they're I think they're very similar teams in, in in kind of what they've done and how good they've looked. Is you know somewhere hovering right behind that tenth spot. Uh, I think you have to have. Uh, just, just some of the other teams up there right now I think are a little bit more deserving of it 
And I, actually, I think there's going to be some crazy shuffles as well, if, if we're just going by the HLTV one, where teams are going to start losing those degraded points. Um, but Cloud9, I just don't, I don't expect them to beat any of the Tier 1 teams yet. I think that's the big thing. I, you know, I, I could see them, I think they're like top of Tier 2. I think they could, you know, fight with Dignitas. I think they can, um, you know, Heroic, those would be some cool games. I think Astralis would be very interesting to see them against. Um, okay. God sent. So I, I wouldn't put them in Tier 1 at all, but I'd say they're like upper Tier 2. Okay. Just punch my mic. Right. What about well? I, that's what rappers usually say when they say that. Like, I'm gonna punch his mic around, like when they kind of <laughs> drop some sick verse. Is that what you were just doing? Was it? Let me that's, drop uh, this flow, motherfucker. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, where would you put him? Would you put him anywhere up, like anywhere close to that? Uh, I mean, I'm gonna do my rankings pretty soon, so I'll have a look at it overall the problem i have at the moment is like they might creep into the top 10 i'm not sure like this top four here is pretty good that's a recent result obviously not that many lands yeah. i i don't i hear the thing i think the ceiling for this team for me is probably to be like seventh or eighth in the world i, I, don't, I don't see them going much further than that right now like i still think the problem is some of these games look like everything's going fantastic actually like an ordinary looked out like everything's going great being heroic etc so if that's the best that they're going to do I'm not sure where they go from that. Like, at the moment, I don't see why Skadoodle and Shroud... Well, Shroud's been in it fucking some his whole career, but I don't know how, I don't know how these players come <laughs> out of it. So I don't have a lot of optimism from them, quite frankly. So they're all yeah, right, I but I don't see them going to superstar status put out way. I think Skadoodle did, like... <coughs> somewhere along the lines, he, he mentally... He's been broken. Like, someone just... <coughs> someone just, like, you know, just destroyed his his mentality his confidence and i don't, I don't see how he's going to bounce back like that's the scary part is i'm not even he's so laid back it's hard to tell if he even cares to bounce back you know like if you have if you've ever tried to talk to skadoodle at an event it's just like you know he's got that whole like laid back farm boy type thing so i can't even tell if he like wants to be the best opera in the world anymore and i think more than any other position as an opera i think you have to like want to just be the most dominant motherfucker out there like that is like the pride position uh, in Counter Strike, it always has been, and I don't see that out of him anymore. Well, I mean, to to touch on something Sean Gares said in that interview I did with him, this is something I've always thought was a downside of Skadoodle and Shroud, which is that in the history of Counter Strike, NA stars have a a really bad rep for being overly cocky. Right, most NA stars who were good players thought, "No, I mean, I, I could be the best rifle in the world." It's like, well, calm down a bit. Like, don't play like that, mate, because you're probably going to get wrecked. The irony is, Shroud and Skadoodle, when they were really skilled players, had the opposite mentality. Like, oh, listen, I'm not really the star player. I'm just one of five guys who works in there. And so as a result, I think that actually damages them. Like, I don't want them to go the delusional set. Like, if it's a huge spectrum, I don't want them to go from one extreme to the other. But I would just like to live in a world where Skadoodle's like, I'm the best opera in North America. So put me that in this position phenomenal. where I want to be right now. Give me this battle against this guy. Like, I'll give you an example, okay? <clears throat> I want to live in a world where when the team has enough for, like, a low buy and one person on the team has enough money for the AWP, Skadoodle's like, give me that AWP, and I will go and get the first pick, and then we'll work from that. I bet that world's never going to exist, unfortunately. So so to me, if I'm Cloud9, I probably invest in literally in like a sports psychology trainer type guy for Skadoodle, and if that doesn't turn around, then you have to start thinking about, do you ever cut the guy? Or even worse, well, at that point, you have to put me in like a Smith's role, don't you? If you want to be the AWP and not be the star, then just be a support player. If you're if you're Cloud Nine and you uh, and Liquid offers you JDM, well, would you jump take on it? it? I'd take it in a heartbeat, mate. For the last yeah. year or so, JDM has been a much better prospect than Skadoodle, especially because he has that in Cloud CLG. The way that team ran was like, there's one guy here as a fucking stud. The rest of us think we could be maybe on our best day can be so if we have the op money we're giving that guy the gun he's going to get two kills and then we're going to go from there you know and that yep. they, listen they could only ride that so far you're not going to get very far at european counter strike with one star but they 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 got a lot out of that they, they at least were pretty solid you know yeah <clears throat> yeah i i found it interesting um I made I made this as like a I made this comment a while back where I think like liquid is the place where opera's gonna die. But I'm just I was just wondering I asked you that question because JDM at the major wasn't wasn't great for for liquid. Not not that he like had to be. It wasn't like sure. he was bad. He just didn't have to be great like he was in CLG. Uh, but still, since then I don't think I don't think we've seen that same JDM from from CLG. So I'm trying to. My next big question about that, as we as we transition away from Star Ladder, would be: Is is JDM like is that is that a product of being in whatever system Liquid likes to run? Is that is that a product of being at that core where Oppers just like can't function well in that team? Because they seem to have an issue of it now, uh, of Oppers not being able to do very well. See, I thought it wasn't a big deal when they were at the major, because to me, when Simple's in the team, 
like this is why you should get all the praise when they do Mega is because the whole thing is based around him I mean he, you can say it isn't but the whole point is if Simple wants to orp this round Simple orps because you know he can do magical shit so in that world I understand that like JDM in theory doesn't have to have everything built around but when Simple went I thought right well the natural order of things now is Elige will be entrying like he used to be JDM will be the main orper will play like a, a like a, a CLG on steroids are like way better, you know, and this will yep. be a very good team. Obviously, that's that's true, but these pilots haven't fit in yet, and JDM hasn't found his place within the lineup yet. All the same, because I haven't seen them play a single LAN, I can't go too far with that. Like, I have to see them offline to really know what they're made of, you know? Are they at Bucharest? Let me have could? a look. Uh, no, they are not. I know they're at ESL in New York, though. Yeah, they're at New York. That'll be the next one, I guess. So, okay. At Star Ladder... What do you think of the fact that Nip won the whole event? Um, I think I think it's it's it's. I think it's actually. I mean, it's hard because as a fan, I I love it. As as someone who just like watches the, the game analytically, I think it's pretty interesting that that Mike Laley comes in. I, I I'm at that point where I'm trying to, um, you know, just watch the vods today and I watched a little bit of the games yesterday, but like. Doesn't like there's this whole tendency of NIP, and then I think Forrest, especially in his career, they've always had those upswings when they bring in a new player. So, I mean, it does feel a little bit like I'm wondering if this is a little bit of that honeymoon. Um, I also, one thing I noticed from watching is the threat wasn't there that I could see. I don't, I don't know if he was just like, a, like, I don't know what the deal is with that, but he wasn't at the event, he wasn't calling. Um, and it looked like they've had like these two big swings, right? With like when they won Malmo, it was all threat's fault, and it looked great because they won it on a very tactical level where they had to beat Navi, who was much better than them in terms of talent, so they had to outplay them tactically, and they did that. Uh, and then they go to the major, and they get beat. Um, and they get they get accused, and rightly so, of being very, very predictable from these tactics and styles. And then coming into this event that they win, I think they found like a pretty comfortable middle ground from watching the grand finals. I think they did a great job of fluctuating between like a tactical style and that free willing skill style. So I think they're kind of uh, you know that that looked good, but I don't know how much of it is that honeymoon period, how much of it is that just playing with Michael Laley, a lot of pressures off of you, whatever it might be. I don't know how much we can take away from it. Yeah, because the weird thing is. Like, on, on one level, I, I didn't like that people were trying to imply he wasn't a stand-in because he played a year and a half ago with them. Like, shut the fuck up. Yeah. Like, that's ridiculous. Yeah. That's that He's absolutely a stand-in. To me, what's funny is it just showed that why he also was super successful when he first came into nap, NIP at the end of 2014. It's because that's what's crazy. They did have, like, instant chemistry. It wasn't... They hadn't built it up. They hadn't played together a long time. Remember, his first land with them, they were on championship point to win the fucking major. So, I, this, I don't know how, but he is someone who just fits in their style. So, my theory when I tried to model it is... I mean, it's funny we had this theme come up again and again with a lot of these teams, but since he has that, like, super streaky style of warping, where you do that crazy, fast-speaking style, you never do want that to be your best player. And, and unfortunately, he, he's, like, one of the most extreme versions of that I've seen, because as much as he'll make highlight rounds, the rounds he doesn't hit those shots, he just gives it up and he dies. And that's why you look at his stats, he dies a lot. So, to me, <laughs> if you're in an IP, I can understand why it works. Because if, if Get Right and Forest are going to have, like, throwback performances that like they had at this tournament, and they're going to be, like, two solid stars but from different styles of the game then you add in Michaelelia as kind of like the just to win key impact rounds just to put you over the top now you've got a team that can be very very dangerous and in a tournament like this win the tournament sure the problem is it's not a, a, something I think you can repeat tournament to tournament to tournament you know like for example I think there's going to be times when he's not very good. I know recently they've had big problems with Get Right. Like, he's had tournaments where he was average. I mean, not even talking star level. So, to me, this is like a... Here's the thing. As a movie, like, one story coming in with, the, with oh, we had to get a different guy in, then we win the tournament. It's a great movie. The difference is, if you make four sequels, they're not going to be very good and they're not going to have the same story, you know? Yeah, I, I think there, there is some, like, weird, as crazy as it sounds, there is some, like, when you watch NIP play with Michael Alien with, without it, there is some kind of, like, weird new energy that they don't have with him. It's much more, like, it's much more, like playmaking. That's that, that's the big thing that I see Michael Ailey bring to the table, is that kind of playmaking. And, you, and you're exactly right. He is, like, that player where it, it is very much, like, sometimes... He He's just going to get wrecked when he does it. It's not going to look phenomenal. Um, and actually, if, if you want to see a perfect example of it, that, that CT pistol run they played on Dust2 against uh, against Cloud9, like, there was, I mean, I won't, I won't go through it, but that is like the perfect example of things could have gone wrong 
for, for Michael Ailey for like 10 straight seconds. He was exposed from like four different angles, and it just so happens the timing's with him, and he turns, and he gets the, he, he finds the right, the lucky time to turn. He gets two headshots with two bullets, um, and it's just, it's crazy. But even on top of Michael Laley, even on top of like those crazy performances from Get Right and, um, and Forrest, one way I don't, I don't think that we can really look at this NIP and say they're going to carry this on into the future is Freiburg, because he had a ridiculously he had a very good event individually. He had a ridiculously good final series against G2, um, and that's something that's a level we haven't seen him hit for a very long time. So I don't think that's going to be consistent. Like if he does find to be consistent, um, it's going to be very 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 good for NIP because he was above in all of his statistics. He was above his three month average. He was above his 2016 average by a large margin in that grand final series. And if you actually look at his stats for the whole tournament, they weren't great for the whole tournament. It was mainly like in the final where he really had like the, the big increase in form. He had games earlier on where he, he was terrible, but they still won the series. So to me, you can't bank on that, obviously. But yeah, the big problem to me is like, I would describe the Makaleli thing like this, is that there almost should be a role that is just called playmaker. And the key thing yeah. is, again, this is like the support thing. It's not going to be like a specific position that always does it, okay? So, for example, you could have a playmaker who actually is a lurker. For example, if you had a lurker who's a great pressure lurker or who, like, purposely like, draws people away from... This, this guy could absolutely be the one initiating, making the plays on the map. That would be fantastic. Obviously, otherwise, you could have a player who's just a beta who plays a lurking style. And by the way, might be good at it. Might, like, get kills doing it. But that's not going to have the same dynamic for helping your team win the game. And one of the problems is like, when I think of that classic Cloud9 lineup that had the three second places, that's one of the areas I was always skeptical about that team because I looked at it and I was like, there's so many passive players in this team that who is the playmaker in the team? I mean, it was probably Freakazoid mixed with Sean Gare's tactics. And so the issue there was Freakazoid was never like a beast individually and Sean Gare's tactics, unfortunately, for whatever reason, couldn't just keep working. I don't know why. I don't know if it was him. I don't know if they became particular. Why. I don't know if people to stop listening. Whatever it was, that aspect didn't work. And so then they did just become a team that was like Shroud and Skadoodle sit in their positions. And if you run into their crosshair, they can kill you. And if they don't, then we're going to have trouble. So it's true. That's something in that Michael Ellie, I think, has brought to these nip lineups. You look at it and it doesn't matter. The whole point is it doesn't matter if he dies. Just doing these things that are unexpected, that throw just like a, a wild card element in there and sometimes have a crazy effect. It doesn't have to be often. It just adds that extra dynamic, which the rest of the team feeds off, you know. Then they, then they can do all their normal roles and now, you, now you, you're dangerous, you know. It's that unpredictability. He's he's like the kind of he's the kind of player where if you're like a very cerebral player in terms of like your, your brain, like you, you've learned how to play Counter-Strike in terms of like... Um, you know the good decisions and the bad decisions and you kind of see it in that black and white. You'll never be able to do the things Michael Ailey does because I don't even think he is aware at times how bad of a decision he's making. Well, it's like, like JW, how, right? Yeah, how dangerous of a situation he's in and all of a sudden you're just like, oh, he's going to get wrecked. This was a stupid idea for Michael Ailey. And then he gets like three kills out of it and you're just like, all right, I don't know what's going on anymore. And that's the kind of player he is. Very frustrating to watch, but like that's that's what NIP misses because they have those old school like get right force exist. They have these old school 1.6 players who in that version of Counter-Strike very much like it's very much defined by good decision, bad decision. I think they still have yeah. a lot of element of that in their play styles. So I don't think they make the same kind of aggressive, same kind of just like balls out attacks that, that Michael Ailey does. And that's, that's what makes him like kind of a breath of fresh air into this team. Well, no, that's what's funny is that's the reason why I actually think as like a really macro theory, why LDLC slash Envious did revolutionize the metagame and create the style that was essentially not actual tactics. It was kind of just finding like favorable matchups and then just playing individually from those. Okay. And the reason why this revolutionized the game is because players like the NIP people, some of the Virtus Pro people, these sort these teams, the Navi guys, most of these players came from 1.6. And 1.6 was I always describe it like this usually position beats aim because if you position yourself really fantastically the other guy has to have unreal like gap between how good your aim and his for him to beat you on pure aim alone like think of it a very simple example if if you take a peek on a certain angle and i've positioned myself to a better position so you're, I, you're not, i'm not where your crosshair is now I'm literally aiming on you as you come out, and you now have to maybe make a huge movement to hit me. Now, if you scream, you might be able to do that. You might still be able to... If you scream and I'm like exist, you might win that duel a decent amount of the time. In 1.6, though, even in that sort of like a difference between scream and exist, exist is going to win a lot of those. Like he might be able to make that 50-50 then. 
He might be able to make up the aim difference like that, okay? So the point is, that mentality is drilled into those players. So the whole point is, yeah. even if you'd gotten a load of the best skilled 1.6 players and told them to play Envious style, their brain would never allow them to do it. Like, they just, that, that is just like, yeah. it's basically like the lowest, uh, it's the lowest, like, expected value way to play the game. If you play that way, as a team especially, you're not going to work. The point with this is, I still don't think that style in general works. Like, I think they pushed the limits of it, that envious team. But I do think CSGO has shown, especially with the OP pistols and all that sort of thing, it's shown a tendency that you need a bit of that in your game. And so every team in general usually needs at least one player who can do that sort of a role. So we've seen it with Makaleli here. Obviously, JW was fantastic at it in the classic Fnatic era. He really played that up very well. And what's funny is I actually think if you look at when JW fell off in Fnatic is when Olaf must have started doing that role himself. That's when he really came to the forefront of he had to make the plays now because guess what? JW wasn't pulling off some crazy stuff. He just became a standard player. So I actually think in, in the future... That's probably Play another maker. another way people should think of teams because if you ever do put together a team that's loads of sick players but they're really passive, I think you're going to see that team have problems. You know, I don't think that will succeed in CS:GO. Ignore the fact that we're wearing different clothes and the lighting is entirely different. This is the same episode, and nothing has changed. So Moses, you were <laughs> just about to say something, which this will seem like like psychic predictive powers, but I believe you were about to just talk about how Nip uh, had interesting <laughs> style, for example, on Cash than when they had Threat. Yeah, I mean, no, it was just it was just cool. It just kind of seems like it's going to be that next progression of NIP that we wanted to see after after Malmo because I mean after uh, after the major, excuse me, because Malmo they won with threat. It was very tactical. It was very very strategic, and it was really cool that watching threat do all that. At the major, when they get knocked out, the criticism and this was you know corroborated by the teams that have been practicing and playing against them forever was that with this style they'd become so predictable because you know what's coming. Um, so just just against G two on on cash. Um, the fourth round, they had like mid control at a minute and 30 seconds left. They had the first kill at a minute. Um, sixth round was like they did mid control again. They did it a little bit differently a reverse boost through the vents from checkers. They had mid control at a minute and 25 and a first kill at a minute and 20. Uh, the seventh was like a really fast paced A hit. So, like, you could see these first like three gun rounds they had in this in this game against G2 were all very, very quick, very aggressive uh, early on in the rounds. And then after that, that's kind of like the old freewheeling style of Nip before Threat even joins the team. Um, and then after that, you start to see that there's a tactical pause by G2, and Nip goes back into their their kind of threat mode, where they're running out of defaults. They're running much slower rounds. Like the ninth round, um, you know, it, it was a slow paced default. G2 pushes into them. Tenth round was you know slow default, and the first kill comes out at 58 seconds left in the round. So they slow things down by like about 30 to 40 seconds after after that timeout, and that's kind of that's kind of what you want to see out of these top teams, especially at IP where it got that they were so predictable is. Um, changing the pace, you know, keeping your opponents off guard. So I just thought that was a really, really cool um, point that I saw that I that I noticed when I was watching that map with Nip and G2 is just the various different ways in which they change the timings of their attacks, and I think that really, really throws off defenses. Can Nip just keep the same five man lineup? Do you think? What's your opinion? Is it fine? Like, obviously, and keep winning is the other. I mean, you can do whatever you want. Actually, you can have the worst team in the world and keep five. But can they keep winning if they keep the the normal lineup? Do you think? Uh, I don't think they're going to jump to some level of winning that like that is going to be some kind of like consistency. We're coming into event after event that they're just going to start winning more. Um, I think they can keep the same lineup and do kind of what they did this year. I don't see any reason why where, where they can be, you know, competitive to a degree where they're, you know, expect them to be in the top 10, top eight of, of majors, make it out of groups and everything like that and win, win the one off event, you know, win, win the Malmo and then, and then a long time later, win the star ladder, maybe win two to three events per year. I mean, they can do that with this lineup. Uh, it all depends on, you know, if they want to make that change, um, and try and actually win more. I think we kind of know what we're going to get out of NIP at this point. So if they want to, if they want to be one of those teams that's going to like be this perennial threat, event in and event out to like win it. If they want to be one of those teams that can try and build some kind of dynasty like they were originally in CS:GO, like we just saw Fnatic's dynasty finish, um, then then I think they would need to make a roster change if they're looking for year-round domination from a the lineup. Then they have to do a roster change, I think. Because this is one of those areas where other people in the industry will just say like oh like why are you even asking that question like they'll be very cynical right and they'll say oh you have to realize the nip players you know they won all those tournaments early in csgo but back when you know they used to win like 
15,000 euros, you know. And so all they want now is they want, like, the, sh the cut of the stick of money every year. They want the odd chance to have a good run, you know. But in general, they don't really care about this notion of, like, you know, trying to be the absolute best for every tournament. And that's why they don't make the drastic roster moves, you know. They just keep the four together and they just make the odd roster move every now and then. And you'll notice it's always that fifth player who just gets replaced. So that's what loads of people in the industry think about Nip. But the problem with that is... I just don't buy it entirely. Like, I actually think that they are just a team who legitimately do think that that four-man lineup can always work. Somehow they always, in their head, can rationalize why, like, this guy's going to come out of a slump or, like, you know, we just need to tweak how we play or we need to change the map that we're good on. That's the thing they've tried to do over and over again. I think they really just believe that somehow they can make this work. And my big problem is they haven't shown it. Like, there's a difference. Virtus Pro even when you can criticize them. And there definitely were areas in time where I was on board with cutting Pasha earlier this year. You know, there's times where I was like, okay, maybe we've pushed this too far. But I'll give Virtus Pro credit. In general, they have won a lot over the years with that lineup. It's not like they just... Okay, so this year, it's true. They only won that really big tournament. They only won yeah. E-League, right? E-League. But... In the past years, okay, 2015, they had a bunch of times where they were dipping every now and You know what? They still won like three or four tournaments. Like, that's the whole point. Every year, they were winning yeah. three or four times, you know. So they've won a lot more than Nip have over the last two or three years. So the big problem I see with Nip is, like, I agree. I think if they keep the same lineup, this could happen. Like, like basically, they need the best case scenario. Like, they need the right opponents. They need, like, a really sick run through the tournament. They, uh, uh, it goes out saying it has to be get right at Forest, go fucking bananas in the whole tournament. If, if these things all line up, I do think they can win tournaments. My problem is, when you look at how often it's probably going to happen, it's probably going to be this sort of a rate. It's probably going to be, like, yeah. two times a year. And unfortunately... Odds are it's not going to be at a major because there are so few majors in a year. Like, the whole thing is, you notice the teams who win the majors in general are the teams who win most of the tournaments. That's how you win a major. You, you, you know, win five tournaments, we've got a good chance one of them could be a major then. So my problem for Nip is I just don't get their mentality. Like, if they really do believe they want to be one of the best, and this is why I've always thought about Nip, they're, they... They're now in a position where it's true. There shouldn't be an expectation they'll ever be the best. There shouldn't be an expectation they'll win the major. But they created that. I mean, they were the best. They let, they let themselves get to this point and paint themselves into a corner where now it's true. Now they are just like, yeah, but we're sort of good now, so why should we change? It's like, no, but to me, like, the goal should always be somehow to try and become number one again. Like, one thing I have a lot of respect for Fnatic for is that when they made that move where, okay, let's not have a, a pointless semantic debate over whether Pronax left or was kicked, because ultimately, if anyone knows how things go behind the scenes, they're often the same thing. But for whatever reason, Pronax left, okay. When that happened and they brought in Dennis, I remember thinking, like, this is a huge gamble, but I can see the logic behind it, you know. And so then when they had that initial success and they won all those tournaments, I was like, fair play. They've made a hard decision. They've thrown away, essentially, the formula that won them win before. And now they've gone with something different, but it's worked. So fair play to them. And they're still trying to trying to reinvent themselves for nip aside from the threat move where they did like change the style of play they've almost yep. never tried to reinvent themselves they do just sit yep. thinking well it'll all turn around in eventually and i don't i don't believe it will okay i well, never bought that do you th i mean if they're ever gonna do it wouldn't you think that right now is like the time that this should have proven they bring michael ailey in they now have pitt who's a full player i mean is do you think there's going to be a roster change now because they win this event with michael ailey because they look so good See, that's the sad thing, is that it doesn't matter what people have said before. There's two instances, okay. So it's when Team Liquid made the final of the major, and then when Nip won this tournament. Like, 99.99% .99 of teams in that scenario, no matter what they said before, no matter what promises they made, no matter what contracts they got, do everything they can to keep that player. Because you've just seen your lineup is somewhat fucking unreal. Like, you've got to at least play it out. Like, that's the whole thing. Whether you succeed or not, you've got to know what would have happened at those next three tournaments if you took that player, you know. Like, even if it doesn't work out, then you at least have the peace of mind of like, oh, phew, it didn't work out in the end. In this scenario, if you're Nip and you don't pick up Makaleli now... Well, this is twice now he's had these two sick little runs where you've looked much more dangerous than afterwards. Like, that's the whole thing about Nip when they first got Makaleli to me. Is it they were never here's the thing, that team was never gonna be the best. Like they were a bit streaky, you know. But they looked so fantastic when they had the really sick games. And the key detail to me was the games that they won that were the really memorable ones were where they went like head to head with the best teams in the world, also playing amazing, and beat them. So that was where I was like, cool, like in this scenario, just be like the ultimate dark horse team, you know. You'll probably win a bunch of tournaments, I think, in that scenario. So to me, Instead, they've always chosen to go like the comfortable route and get the guy who fits them more socially or whatever the storyline is. So unfortunately, I have to say at the moment, 
I think they probably don't make a roster move. But I don't know if this is what you're alluding to. But to me, if anything, this should help you because actually you're not making yeah. a straight roster move. You're just removing whoever you think is the player that you don't need. And you've already got the player. You've got McLean's already here. Pitt's already here. Just pick one other player to remove. Try that team out. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the thing as well, because I know when, when I've been asked this question, when I've thought about this kind of question after that win, I'm just like, I actually don't have the answer to that, because it is it is a weird situation where, you know, it's it's the entire thing where, where people have always said, we, why would we want to be the fifth revolving player in NIP? Well, now, um, like, Pitt has been playing well. Like, Pitt, Pitt was a great addition to that team, I thought. Yeah. I think he looked, he was sick for them in Malmo. He's part of the reason why they won that event. Um, he's been very, very consistent, very reliable in his production. Um, so now it just comes to they have they have all the pieces to do it, and and they have Michael Laley, and they just won an event with him riding high off that. So yeah, if they're if they're ever going to do it, I think it's now. Otherwise, um, I can't imagine a scenario in the future where they decide to make it happen. Uh, so so that that's going to be interesting to see how that plays out. But I'm I'm not entirely sure. I don't have faith that they're going to do it because they've always been so dedicated yeah. to that. For I mean, here's the thing. Okay, I. Put it this way, this might sound like a weird way to phrase it, but let's say they tried this move. They remove a player, they can pick who it is, Freiburg exists, one of those two it obviously has to be. They remove the player, they bring in Makaleli, and they just have the three of the original players and Makaleli and Pitt, right? If they make that lineup, even if they then bomb every tournament and they fuck up the next major and they don't qualify, you know what? I wouldn't necessarily blame it on the move. I'd say, you know what, it didn't work out, like you played badly afterwards, things went poorly, but... I understand making the move. Whereas if they go the other way, let's imagine they don't pick up Makaleli and they don't win any tournaments for the next six months. And you know what? Maybe they even struggle in the qualifier or maybe they have like the odd okay result. I will always look back and go, I mean, there was kind of another path you could have taken here, guys. Like I would have, yeah. I would have tried that out, you know? <laughs> well, and also, I mean, just even to build on that, the, the timing of this, the fact that there's not a third major this year, like that it's would perfect, be one right? way. Yeah, that'd be one way where you could say, all right, Nip is just keeping this roster because it's what they've been playing with. They have another major. Usually it's what, at the end of October is when the third major has been historically in November. So it's coming up here in like a month and a half, two months. That's normally what you'd kind of say and how you could rationalize it in that sense. But yeah, with with no third major, it just feels like all the obstacles out of out of any roster change, if they want to make them, uh, have been removed. So, I mean, this, this is the time for them, I think, if they're going to do it. Yep, agreed. So... That one's, a, that one's just a weird one because it's one of those scenarios where a team wins the tournament, but you can't even be like, oh, it's like liquid after the major. Oh, I can't wait to see the next one. Oh, that's right. Yeah, they won't have the same lineup. Yeah, so it right. won't be it the same. It doesn't actually mean much in the long term. <laughs> it just sucks the life right out of it, doesn't it? <laughs> so, okay, here's my here's my other question then. So the other final of this, to this tournament, I actually feel like G2, even though they finished second and yet yeah, on paper versus Pro, Navi, etc., because the only team they lost to was Nip, I actually feel like it's a little underwhelming. Like for me, as soon as I saw those other teams go out in the group stage, and then I saw who would made the playoffs, I was like, if you're G2 and you really want to put your name up there, like, listen, we're like, a ch like obviously, first of all, we're the, one of the only teams that has like a winning record against fucking SK. And not only that, but after the major, okay, if we hadn't have been in the Fnatic SK group, you know, we would have gone deep. This is where you got to prove yeah. it, you know. This is a tournament where you're supposed, like the path has opened up for you to win the tournament now. And so when they didn't do that, even though I'll, it's true, except for Cash in the final, they did play fantastically the whole tournament. It was a really great tournament, another great example of their skill set. And I'll definitely give them credit in as much as I had wondered if they would like flame out of this sort of form a month or two ago, and they've returned to it. So that's very encouraging. With yeah. that said, what do you think about G2? Does G2, can they just keep the same lineup? What do you think? Yeah, I think they can. Um, I think they're, I mean... We're talking about a team that's been one of the best, probably one of the top four teams in the world the past, I mean, since since that EPL run they made uh, back whenever that was, months. Um, this has been a really, really strong team. So I don't see any reason why they would have to make a roster changes. There, are, There's obviously one glaring one where you would think that that would be, you know, Smith's. That's, that's kind of the question of where you'd come into. He's the one to replace. He's really like the only one on that team you look at and you say that's the replaceable one. Um, but I think with how comfortable they are with him, there is something to that. As silly as it sounds, like if those players players actually think that Smiths is bringing a lot to the table. Um, I'm fine with him being on the team. I think the one the one biggest issue is because he's in that opera role. I think we touched on this last night. Because he is the opera of that team, that's why you notice that drop in production so much because that weapon has such a big impact. Um, but, I mean, these, this is a team that, you know, got to the finals of EPL, um, got to, they won, what, ECS Season 1. Uh, if they weren't in the group of death of the major, they'd probably do some fantastic things there. Uh, they got to the finals here again, and, yeah, they had a little bit of an easier route due to the ups sets but i mean this is a team that's getting to finals of, of tournaments with some of the best teams in the world in it so I'm, sure, i don't yeah. think they're at any point of like critical we need to make a, a change like right now i think they're still in a, a pretty 
pretty great spot, uh, especially if you look at, you know, the, like Fnatic is going to have to rebuild and recover. Godsend is, is looking like hell. Um, you know, Estrella still has their issue with choking. Navi just bombed out. Virtus Pro isn't looking strong. So um, they they have a lot of they have some time around them before they have to get into any kind of like we need to start winning now. Uh, yeah, this is a time with all these teams slumping, but um, it's not like it's not like they're they're being challenged to be dropped out of the top five in the world. Yeah, uh, the thing is, uh, here's the thing. I, I think this event was borderline. Like, for me, I think you probably should have won this event. I, this was like a yeah. must-have. So that is like a, a... Let's put that as like the first warning sign. So we'll take the major and we'll take this. And these are the first two warning signs that like... If, if you get a couple more of these, then I think that's when you have to pull the trigger. And you well, have to if make they don't move. qualify for the next major, right? That's, that's going to be the big one, I think. Because to me... The second you ever need to think about a roster move, it has to be Smiths and it has to be Kenny S comes in. I mean, I don't, I don't see any logical reason how you can get around that. You know, like you look at the roles of who they have in the team, you look at what they bring. Like that's the thing to me at the moment. The only logic I can have is maybe they themselves psychologically feel comfortable playing with Smiths because I'd love to see someone. This is one of those areas where. For all the people who are fans who think they're super smart about the game, this is where you can get involved and become one of the number one content creators in the world, okay? If you're a fan of Smiths and you watch the games a lot and you think you're an intelligent guy who studies the game, make a video, 10-minute video, with a bunch of different scenes from games and you just analyze what, what Smiths is bringing to the team. You know, you show us like an interesting flash that he pulled off that worked with another player or you show how he, he kind of like intuitively backed someone up in a way where obviously he was like helping them out in that sense. If you could show that sort of thing, by the way, I think most of us would love to see that. It would be a fantastic piece of content. Instead, people just tend to use really weird logic of like, yeah, but he's friends with them or like, oh yeah, but no, but he says he does a lot of things. Well, this is all great. Like you're a, yeah. that's, that's just someone's opinion, you know, even if it's the player himself. So my big problem with all of that is, yeah, it always comes back to the AWP angle, which is I can, I can let so many people get away with being support players in good teams if they are just straight up support players. I don't know any support AWPers, mate. I don't know any that, that do this role. Like for example, since he's not even that sick with as an AWPA, then, okay, why does he have to have the AWP in all these positions? Yeah, That's another weird one. Okay, we all know he's good on Dust 2. There we go. Dust 2, you get to have an AWP. But for example, I mean, the great example in that final, obviously, was that round on Overpass where he was at the sandbags and he couldn't kill a guy who was just fucking planting <laughs> with the AWP, which is like, listen, mate, come on. Like, let's not get silly now, shall we? If you, a, if you have a rifle there, even as a cretin who misses, you're going to hit bullets into him at least, aren't you? Like, come on. He's doing your you job know? for you, basically. At that come point. on. Come <laughs> on. Yeah, that's, that's when I made that joke where, like, the round yeah. later was where that observer, like, missed everything. I was like, is the observer Smith? The motherfucker misses everything. Like, here we go. Bat rub. <laughs> <laughs> he basically just throws to me underarm all game long. Didn't he? I'm just cracking yeah, fucking yeah. home runs up the park. <laughs> and then everyone's like, wow, you are the new Barry Bonds. Not really. I've just got a shit at giving me underarm throws. Like. <laughs> Also, my head didn't get four times bigger over the last three years. Yeah, no ironically, story. ironically, metaphorically, it did Moses. In many ways, I am yeah, the Barry Bonds, you know. Inflated. Skrilla is like the steroids, and as I've gotten more and more, my head has sort of gotten unnaturally larger over the last three years. So that's not bad. Not, not bad. bad. Not bad. Um, yeah, no, I mean that—that that is the big thing. Is that op role? I think the only player I've seen ever be some kind of successful with a supportive op style okay. would be Neo on Virtus Pro. Okay. When he was opting for that team, um, I thought he had a very, very passive and very supportive style where, like, he rarely, like, he only dueled other oppers and other opponents. Like, if he absolutely had to, the, the majority of his opping was, was like, okay, we're doing this execute. I'm going to cut off this one angle. And you guys don't have to worry about anyone peeking from this angle. Like, I'm just going to sit here and stare at it, and I will kill anyone that comes and peeks this angle. Um, and uh, it worked for them. It worked very well for Virtus Pro, I thought. Um, but outside of that, I think oppers in general, like, y if you're an opper, you don't have you don't have that supportive attitude. I, t I, I, I touched on it last night when we were talking about Skadoodle, where, like, you have to have that pride as an opper of being, like, the, the shit. You have to be the best. You have to be able to peek into an opposing opper and just dominate him and make him your bitch. And, and Smith doesn't have that. All right. <laughs> Ironically, Smith speaks into our opposing oppers and makes himself their bitch. So his problem is he's just got the he's got it the wrong way around, you know. He's got it backwards. Yeah, he's got it backwards. So that's his problem. 
Yeah, um, that's that's the big one. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm I'm comfortable with G2 where they're at. I think they still have some more time. The hard part is like as I said, like the the, ne- the major qualifier is the next one. I think that's when a lot of teams will start looking at this and say, if we don't qualify, then this is where the red flags start popping up. Um, and as we've touched on, the next major qualifier is going to be fucking insane. So yeah. good luck. Well, the thing is. This is also why I think it is key when you start to watch like the losses, the key moments where they didn't succeed. Because essentially, from talking to people behind the scenes, the only thing that has stopped another French shuffle is contracts. Because what's happened yeah. is, as everyone's probably seen, it's gotten now with contracts so that every contract has built into it a ridiculous buyout. And so teams now... The buyouts are too large, you know, like you can do one of those every now and then. Like if you were literally getting like some simple level guy, okay, maybe you do a buyout there because you know it's like worth it for the long term, like history of your franchise. But the whole thing is when it's someone who's just like that you could wait three months to get him at the moment, teams are just going to wait. That's why you've seen it happen already. And so what's been told to me is in the French scene, they are literally just waiting for contracts to run out. And as soon as contracts run out, there will be some sort of shuffle. Now, success of G2 probably determines how many pieces go in that shuffle. But unfortunately, as I've mentioned in many of my videos about the French scene, it's not always like intuitive either. Like, Unfortunately, it all runs on the politics of who likes who. And so, for example, there are famous players who are very skilled players who I wouldn't kick out who will get kicked out. I mean, what's funny is here's a great example of where inside info meets a fan's opinion and the fan takes totally the wrong analysis. Okay, here's a great one. Okay, you know, I, I said in my video that politically it's possible Scream might get kicked out of G2 yet someone like Happy might get brought in now I understand that's not a good move I'm not saying it's a good move I'm saying knowing the people involved that is a real possibility so I'll give you another example do you remember a long time ago I was one of the people who first started mentioning because I knew it wasn't like taboo to say or anything like it was just known behind the scenes that Oscar was going to mouse and so people would say to me yeah but if Oscar went to mouse what player would you replace and if you remember I always stressed it will be either Dennis or Nick and people would be like, well, you're, no, 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 you, you've got that wrong there. You meant to say Dennis and Spiddy. And I said, well, no, listen to what I'm saying. The whole point is <laughs> their logic is it's either Nex isn't performing as a star, so Oscar comes in to replace him as a star, or they remove Dennis because he's just playing so badly. Now, what's funny is who did they remove in the end? They removed Nex. And this is exactly the reason why, because they're it's the way the team models how they're going to play in their mind. It's who they think they're replacing. And what's funny is in that scenario, by the way, I don't even think that's that off as a replacement because Nex was like failing as a star player. So yeah. Actually, believe it or not, if you give next Dennis's positions, he might not play as well as Dennis, as bad as Dennis is. Like it doesn't matter. Like that's not as ridiculous as it seems. So anyway, the point is, these sorts of scenarios will often be counterintuitive because we're not going. This isn't football manager, you know. This isn't like a computer game where you just look at the stats and go, right, well, this guy's a seventy-eight and he's an eighty-three, so I'll keep the eighty-three. No, if people really think, uh, going back to the comfort angle, I would rather play with this guy. You'll see it happen in Counter Strike. So personally, I think. I have to say, since I don't think G2 is going to win a major, and I don't think they're going to win many more tournaments, I think I think they can make sick runs at this. And they can, for me, G2 is the dark, the dark horse team, okay? Because first of all, they have the matchup advantage over SK, which is super sick. And then it's more like if they get really hot, they can go super fast. So to me, they're a dark horse team. But as a result, I don't think they're going to rack up enough trophies before whenever the contracts run out. Let's say it's in four months. Let's say it's in six months. I think inevitably you will have that French shuffle. It's just, it just going to happen sooner or later. Yeah, they need to have a they need to have a strong end of the year. How did you like that? Uh, How did you like that Shocks versus Kenny S uh, matchup though? That was pretty sick. That was pretty it was good. Like, it was pretty good. Yeah. The funny thing is, I've noticed a lot of the criticism of Kenny S. Like I'll say at the at the outset, Kenny S's career over the last year and a half is legitimately shocking to me because this was a guy where for anyone who didn't watch early CS:GO, he was one of the only players who was never bad in CS:GO. Like if you're thinking of what a star is in CS:GO, he was literally a star every second of CS:GO until basically that like end era of Titan where he started to drop off a bit and then he went into Envious, okay. So for like literally we're talking 2 years almost, this guy was always really good. As in even when they kicked him out of very games, right? And he was at yeah. one point in time he actually he, was, he initially went to the second best French team and then when Happy made that LDLC team. He was in the third best French team. Actually, he was in the Clan Mystic team. So even on the third best French team, you could watch his play, and he was like a he was like a Nico, he was like an Oski, he was just a straight one man carry, right? And so as a result, the one thing I thought I could always rely on with this guy is his individual level would never drop off. Now I'll tell you straight up, from the Titan era onwards, 
in en- Envious, he has only shown like flashes of being that sort of player again. Like he's yeah. had he's had a tournament here or there, or he's had uh, maybe like let's say at most like a three week period he might have been really sick, but he's never hit it consistently. He's never consistently been like again a top ten player in the world. And now one thing I will say though, with that said is that I don't think it's fair when people compare him in Titan and Envious now, because when they compare him now, even if Envious says, yeah, we're going to build things more around Kenny S, yeah, the difference was all of Titan was based around Kenny S. Everything was based around him. So I don't think you can expect as much. With that said, this was sort of a flashback performance. I mean, he was the only reason they had any right being in that game, I thought. Yeah, no, he was a monster. Uh, and but I think I don't even think it's it's really. I think it's more Kenny than Envy because like the weird thing is I did that interview with him at E League and I was just like, when are when are we going to see that Kenny that that's going to carry that's going to be a beast that's going to be the star player, and and he just he like the words he used was that that Kenny is dead. I'm making I'm making a new one. I'm this is going to be a different Kenny S. Yes, it's still going to be a good player, but the Kenny that everyone saw two years ago is is not there. And then when you talk to the envious guys, they're like, yeah, we want to start building things around Kenny. So like there's this weird discrepancy between what, from those two parties of what's going to be created like what is it what's going on exactly because everyone else seems to say we want we want to focus on kenny being the star and build the strats around kenny and kenny's saying i don't like i'm I'm not that player anymore i I need to move on from that player um so i I don't i don't know what's going on i think i think that's probably at the root of of a lot of those problems um and the other one i would dude I, i want to see old school nbk back I want to see like you know how like NBK was the one when when Envy was created he was the one who started taking all like you know kind of the, the support roles or like the less popular roles um, you know the positions on the maps on the CT sides where you know you're not always going to be in the spotlight you're not going to rack up all the kills the tough spots to take um, that I, NBK I remember is the only player in the original dominance of NIP when they were like undefeated he was like the only player that you could see was able to match up to like Forrest and Get Right in some of those games he was dropping like 36 kills against them. I want to see that NBK back. I think he needs to come back if that team's going to have any life in it. Yeah, but that's the problem with Envious to me, is that the whole... Here's the one rule that Envious was based around, is that no matter what happens, no matter whose role gets taken, no matter who gets put over here, no matter who gets diminished, no matter what map we play, the one rule has to be that we all trust that Happy knows what he's doing. And the problem was, eventually, they started losing, even though Happy was doing, you know, he was doing what he wanted to do. He was having people replay the roles he yeah. wanted them to play. And then it literally got to the point, eventually, where that rule was gone. And now even the players didn't trust Happy. And the problem then to me is, is that Happy's style <coughs> was so predicated on the notion he knew how the game was going to play because he, he had set his own meta game right? That when it didn't work anymore... Even he didn't know what to do. And then even worse, because he's then gone and they removed him as the leader, now no one knows what to do. And even worse, everyone's like inverted their playing styles and all sorts of mad shit. So the only player they had left, and you'll notice this, is this, this is no coincidence I'm saying this. Think of the one player who does still have the odd game where he goes ham and wins them games. It's Apex. He's the only yeah. player that didn't have his playing style completely fucked up or changed in some weird way. And that's one of those things where people... People really don't understand this. Like, maybe you can talk to this as an ex-player, but I've seen in Counter-Strike some really key examples that were absolutely shocking to me where a player would, like, retire and then come back in some sense and he could never be the same player. So I'll give you two great examples, okay? Is when CGS began and there was Source, Zet went over, the Swedish player, right? And at the time, no joke, he was probably the best player in the world. This guy was unbelievable. But when he came back from CGS, even though he played, like, you know, two more years, and he, you know, he practiced as much as he could, and he played with top teams like SK, and he played all, you know, he had every chance to become that player again. He never got even close. I'm talking even close. And the whole thing you could tell had changed was his whole mentality. And it's like, as soon as he found he was shit when he came back to 1.6, he never recovered mentally, and he could never get to that sort of player again. Yet, logically, it's so weird because because you think to yourself, well, I mean, aim, these, these are all routine things, you know, like they're built on some talent and maybe some natural like muscle fiber or whatever. But essentially, it's routine. It's rhythm. You know, you think you can get back to that level again. But then the other example, OK, is the same thing happened from CGS, actually, with Method. Method went to CGS as uh, from 1.6 as one of the most skilled players. And in CGS, actually, he immediately went to shit in Source, actually. He was terrible there. And then when he came back, I'm not joking, in the first, like, ESEA season, I remember he had something crazy. Like, he had, like, 40 ADR for, like, the whole season. Like, unworld, <laughs> otherworldly. Like, we're talking about he was worse than, like, shit players on, like, UMX or whatever, you know. Like, it was, it was really, really embarrassing. And so, in these two instances, I really do think, as bizarre as it seems... This is why if you have a superstar player, you never fuck with their game. Like, you never mess with whatever works there. You never try and, like, 
train them out of things that they're doing that are working because dude those players are so rare as it is who knows if you can get that guy back to that place again yeah i mean i I know from that i mean you nailed it a lot of it is the mentality a lot of it is coming coming back to a game or or being in a situation where like especially like even when i tried to come back and in csgo and play professionally it's the mentality of being able to focus on practice for four hours and then when you're done with practice Go play two to three hours of Pug. Go play Rank S, FPL, whatever it might be. Go Deathmatch. Um, doing all that work. And, I mean, yeah, the, the typical argument that you're going to see is, but they get paid to play it. They should just do it. And it's like it's not it's not just like that. It can't just be going through the motions. You have to be engaged in in watching the demos, in learning, in working with the teams. It's it's that that kind of mentality that really goes away that, that's really tough when, when, you're, when you've played Counter-Strike for like seven, eight years at a competitive level. Um, you know, your, your desire to change things because that just adds more work like if you're going through a funk or if your team's not playing well, you're in a slump and you need to adjust some tactics, it's are you going to be really that focused when you're sitting through a dry run and talking about what's going to change with the team? That's why I give all the props in the world to teams like to, to teams like Virtus Pro, um, th- those three guys that, that have been playing for a long time and then, and then get right in force, the fact that they're still able to do this and win these events, um, that's, that's tough to do. And it's not tough to do, or it's, it is tough to do from a skill aspect, but it's the mental game. It's that focus that, that really... Um, that really is the tough part, um, and especially. I, I mean, it's just when you when you come back and you realize your shit, it's like you almost don't believe it, right? You, there is still like a certain. I, I know I know players. I, I don't I don't think I don't think Virtus Pro has that. I don't think like the NIP guys have that. But I have known players who have tried to make those comebacks, and there is like a certain level of entitlement where they're like, "I was the shit at the time. Why do people not respect me anymore?" And it's like, motherfucker, you were good four years ago. Who cares now? Like th- there is that sense of entitlement when, and back in 1.6, when if you were a really good player, you were you were a legend for like five years at a time. And now the the, the community is not like that anymore. It's just kind of moved on. We move on quicker. Here's the sick thing though. You've just reminded me of something else that's a problem with Nip there. Okay, so here's another reason why I don't buy the logic that Nip like. Because so, here's the problem with the idea that they're being very cynical. Okay, and that they're just cashing in on like the fame of Nip and sticking together. That implies that they sort of understand deep down that the team isn't good enough to win an actual Counter Strike now and that they have accepted like well we're just not going to be as good but we're going to do what we can the problem is if you ever talk to these players they don't believe they don't believe that like i can tell you privately they are the same way they used to be when they were the best like they still think every loss is like you know they were lucky and like oh we shouldn't have picked that map or like oh if i hadn't just died early in this 1v2 my other player we would have won it you know and so a great example of this what we saw recently right was there were these two interviews done I can't remember if they were on Splice or another site, but they were done with Threat and with Freiburg. And at the end of the Freiburg interview, Freiburg said some sort of line that, like, you know, something about Get Right, and that that's why Get Right is still the best player in the world or something. And then Threat in his interview was asked about Forrest, who obviously was doing very well, and he said something like, well, that's why people call Forrest the best in the world or something. And so what you have to realize here is, that's my point when I said about the fact that they still think that this four-man, like, combo can work. They, to me, it sounds weird, but one of the reasons why I don't think it can work is because I look at Get Right and Forest and I'm like, dude, you two aren't who you were three years ago. And even if you were, as harsh as this sounds is, even if you were, I don't know if you'd be the best combo anymore. We've had a lot of great combos come since then, okay? So the problem is, I actually think, if you look at the way they talk in interviews in private, I think they still believe that shit. Like, they still believe that, like, Get Right's in some sort of funk, he's going to snap out of it, he's going to become the best player in the whole world. It's like, I mean, remember, those were the conditions for Nip to win. Get right and wasn't just the best player. He was like the best player by like whoop, massive, like massive gap. And then the second best player in the world also was on his team. You can't fulfill that win condition anymore. That is, yeah, and right. that is a ludicrous win condition to expect. That is an insane, insane yeah. level they have to hit to, to do that. Uh, yeah, I, I, well, I mean, that's yeah. There's probably some of that mentality in there. Um, I also think those two guys have just spent so long as the best players in the world. It's probably hard to even come to that realization, right? Um, I mean, how, I think when flip side, I think when time. Waylanders like stamping on your head and kicking <laughs> you out of a fucking med, that's probably a, a, a wake up call, you know, a wake up call. It's like there's a great, okay, there's a great <laughs> Charles Barkley quote that he actually says all the time, okay? So he says one of the ways when he got old in his career that he actually realized it was time to retire is he said it's one thing, you know, if you're getting older and you're not quite as good, but he said as soon as people who can't even play are kicking your ass, he said it's just time to get the fuck out. So it's going to be the same way. Like, here's the thing, okay? I don't know if anyone's been following Flipside since the major, but Flipside aren't doing very well, and Waylander is shit at the moment. Like, he had his issues before. He was a very up-and-down player in Gambit. I thought he was never a star player anyway, but he, okay, he could be 
be up and down. He's actually been quite bad over the last few months. And yet this is the guy who basically styled on NIP over a three-map series. And as a result, NIP, whoop, off to the fucking qualifier next time. So that has got to be a wake-up call. Like, there's only so many of those can happen yeah. before you're like, oh, it's, it's bad luck, in it? It's like, well, you must be the most unlucky motherfucker in the world. Like, come on. Yeah, that's 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 actually a really good point. Consider that team just just beasted him. So, um, yeah, but then they have these flashes like this, and I don't even think that this is why I actually think as as odd as it's going to sound, Michael Laley and Forrest playing well for NIP. This is also why I think I don't even know if I attribute that tournament win necessarily to get right. I think Freiburg was the biggest the biggest fact that they won that whole event. Like Forrest had a sick event. Uh, sick finals, but like Freiburg, with his production that he had, like compared to where his average is, the extra production he threw in during the finals, um, that's the reason they beat G2, is those those unexpected extra 10 kills he got that he hasn't been averaging over the past three months. The unexpected, like, I think it's uh, 17 ADR um, that, they, that he hasn't been averaging over the last three months. So like those jumps and those stats... Um, but yeah, like this, this just goes back to even the point of get right and force. You can't rely on those those peaks. You can't rely on players hitting like that far, punching a, that far above their their standard performance, like event in and event out. So um, yeah, I mean uh, that's that's just players are always going to believe they're going to be able to hit those peaks and have that, those same runs though. Like the players always believe it, and it's it's kind of like that mentality of a pro player. They they almost you have to be that confident. You have to just say it. Um, and maybe they're, they're a little bit blinded at the moment. I think like, that's entirely possible. Like, when they lost to Flipside, like, I'm kind of outlining here, I didn't think at all that Flipside... Like, I, put it this way, man for man, I don't think Flipside's better than Nip. Like, if you no. remember, the three people who went ham in that series was World Edit, Markolov, and Waylander. Now, Markolov is a fucking support player. He's not a star player. Wayland is very up and down. Okay, World Edit is supposed to play well for them. So, basically, they got, like, two players going ham in that series that normally don't. Then you got to add in... As we said, at the time, everyone kind of understood how Nip played. Well, one of the guys who's been one of the smartest at, when he knows how someone's going to play is yeah. Blade from Wilder. So you add it together, like it is the perfect storm of a lower team who could beat you. It's like another example, okay, of where I feel like it's so sad that in CS this actually happens. Because I understand, right, in League of Legends, why they people used to fans used to get really whacked out by like upsets because they had this mad line of logic right which was like well if you beat them then you are better than them I said, well calm the fuck down like calm down right now and so the point is in cs that shouldn't exist right because we play so many tournaments that yeah. you, you get a great damn not only do you get a great like data set of how good teams are but you get to see them against tons of opponents so you get to really see like overall how good a team is you know like i wondered early on for example is part of why g2 went so ham because initially in those first couple of tournaments they were playing against like Fnatic and sk maybe they just have a good match against those teams no they've now showed me they've got a bit more consistency they're a bit more well-rounded than that well for example a great example of where you can't think that because a team beats someone they're better than them to me is Tai Lu. Because Tai Lu have pulled off these two upsets now. They won this game in the group stage here. Uh, that was the Na'Vi one, right? They beat Na'Vi. And then earlier in the year, obviously, they beat Luminosity, now SK Gaming, in a best of three, actually. Now, the key thing about it to me is it's not that Tai Lu is, like, the amazing new team who's going to crack the top five soon and one day... Like, I don't know. I have no signs yet that they will ever do that. But what I do think about this team is that they just have a great stylistic counter matchup to certain teams, especially if you don't know how they play. That's another key deal. If you've never played them before, yeah. it's going to be tough to figure out on the fly. They, they remind me of where um, Keith Stars was at the beginning of 2015. Like They're that team that will come in and have the upset. They have a little bit of a different play style that, that teams haven't adjusted to. Uh, teams haven't really learned how to counter. And actually, I think it's, I think it's funny. One thing I noticed in Malmo, um, and, and I haven't seen their matches yet from Starliner, was their, their style of play was like so passive it almost felt like they were playing in like a past meta they were playing like that much more like laid back defensive style where they gave you a lot of map control and then they just stopped you from there which is very very difficult to do um, but I think teams are going to be able to start taking advantage of that I don't think anyone's gotten to the point yet where they've started really looking at Tai Lu and saying this is a danger they're, they're saying yeah they've, they've had this cool upset here they've had this cool upset there um, and on top of that I don't think teams see them enough to really warrant looking into them for the most part like that was the one thing with Keith Stars and then Luminosity is when they had this style that was so that was so effective, on, you know, in those upsets and they, they couldn't really win series, but they could upset you on a map. They could play you very very close. They they were being seen at multiple and many events in North America. They were going to they were going to Katowice. They were going to international events. They were at majors. Tai Lu hasn't hasn't been able to do any of that yet. So we've really only seen them at two events outside of outside of Asia. 
So once that team starts going to more events, I think we're definitely going to see the rate of their upsets just dip massively. Also, I like this is one of those scenarios where it's a nightmare that we had to do this like podcast over two days because I can't remember yeah. everything we talked about the first one. But I don't think we talked about Ty Lue, so I don't think I've used this point. But actually, there was a point, a general point that I noticed about Ty Lue, that another thing is a lot of people were commenting on how like they look like they all have super high sensitivities or whatever. And yeah. so this is something I've noticed is quite a famous trend throughout the history of Counter-Strike for Asian teams, right? Because famously in China and Korea, the main play, per, place you initially play Counter-Strike or any game is in a PC cafe, okay? So first of all, they have those, you know, those old school mouse pads, like the small one. In fact, I've got yeah, one yeah. here. It's like, like this big. It's not, not huge. <laughs> the small ones. And then, so first of all, you have to learn to play with less room to move. And so... If anyone doesn't know this, one of the reasons why such low sensitivities develop in Counter-Strike is because people started using bigger bigger mouse pads. Like, obviously, you can't have a tiny one if you have to do, like, a, an equivalent of three sweeps on it to do a 180. You want to do the same one sweep, but a huge one with your arm. So, as a result, back in the day, you know, it's understandable why people had higher sensitivities. Plus, a lot of them had shitty mice. Like, if you have a bad mouse... I hope people know this as well. You can't use super low sensitivity. It will spaz out when you try and move really fast. So these are reasons naturally why a lot of the Asian players will have higher sensitivities, especially if they've just gotten used to that. But there's, a, there's another reason that I wanted to just bring up, and this is the reason I bring this point up, is because people, as a result, unfortunately, associate it with like, oh, they have higher sense and their aims are just crazy. Like when I've watched Tai Lu, I don't think there are a lot of crazy aimers in that team. I think there's a couple that have pretty good aim and the rest are just like, all right, compared to the international level. It's not that they have just like five sick aimers and that, like, because that's what's all, people who don't understand the Asian styles always try to like make that the stereotype. It's always, they have crazy aims and they just don't know how to play the meta and they always play super aggressive all the time. That's not at all the case with Tai Lu. So to me, the point I want to make is when you have a higher sensitivity and most people watching this right now, okay, know what pros play with. So most people have a good mouse. They use like, you know, 400 to 800 dpi they use a reasonable uh, lower sensitivity so they can be more stable and they you know all the basic stuff if you haven't played for a long time with a higher like say if you doubled your sensitivity tomorrow anyone watching this can try this double your sensitivity and go and play some deathmatch what you will find is you won't be a better player right now you won't necessarily be much worse but what you will find is because you have a higher sensitivity you can now go for and hit certain shots that would be almost impossible with your lower sensitivity like certain flick shots certain shots that were like very rapid fire obviously do an instant 180 so when you pull that shot off you will think initially try this app out as an exercise you will think oh shit i'm staying with this i'm way better with this but what you won't think of is like that's the upside you can do this part that you couldn't do before well there'll be a downside as well like for example now you won't be you know when you do that full 30 bullet full full auto spray on the guy who's at medium range now it's going to be a way harder to hit all those bullets now you won't do it with as much consistency now you won't be able when you sneak up behind the guy to like instantly go onto his head and do the instant like two bullet spray to his head because you might miss because you have a much higher sensitivity at long range now so the the point here i'm trying to make here is next time you're watching those games it's just a it's a bit naive to think that they just have these mad aims it's actually just that's what happens when you have high sensitivity and that's why there is no good or bad to sensitivity like famously this is uh, this even happens at a pro level so the reason why forest is considered one of the sickest aimers in the world is because he uses the highest sensitivity and as a result guess what he's not considered one of the sickest sprayers in the world is he is it, it's not a coincidence yeah. that these things all could follow you know so it's just a side point but i thought it might be interesting especially for the newer players you know no, I, I loved. It. I mean, we talked. You you mentioned that point in the in the E League green room at one time, and and that, I thought that was a sick point because as well. I mean, it just means that in certain situations you're just not as effective. So I mean, maybe that's that's going to be part of the learning curve that they have to have is when they really struggle, especially during executions, because with that higher sensitivity, it's when players are like close up to you, turning a corner, and you're trying to hold an angle, just the slightest you know tweak of your hand, and the, and then you go too far. So that's where they're really going to struggle. So that's something maybe that the more experience they get in the pro in in the professional scene that we have in Europe and North America, they might have to actually adjust and lower some of that sensitivity. Like, that's um, why I always thought it's a mistake for people who do just like switch around their mouse all the time and switch around the sensitivity yeah. all the time because what they're doing basically is what I'm talking about here they're getting the initial benefit of something they didn't have but then they're ignoring what they lost and then inevitably they they find out the full like gamut of what it's going to be like with this new sense or new mouse and they go oh I want to go to a different one so to me the ideal way to do it is it's not high low new mouse what you want to do is you want to figure out what is your style of play how do you like to play the game and so for example if you like to play the game as like a lurker who goes really slow and you just want to like ensure that you get a kill once you get the lot then you probably want a lower sensitivity and you want to play that style with a mouse that fits that okay but if you want to be some twitch orpos like makaleli style pop popping out and just instantly hitting everyone then do that but then you can't 
can't then complain when like he can't do the fucking so slow style. Like the whole point is, it's it's kind of like fool's gold to think you can have it all at once. That like, you can't. <laughs> yeah, no, you, it's it's one or the other in that kind of situation. So yeah, that's 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 pretty cool. I like that about Tyloo. That's pretty sweet. Um, yeah, they they I think they're. I don't know where I'd put them. I don't because just with the upsets, I mean, I don't think I've, they'd obviously know we're near the top ten. But I, I think, I mean, I know you mentioned that tweet. You said that you think stylistically they just match up very, very good against certain teams. But I mean, this is this is a team that did. I mean, how much stock do you put in some of the upsets they had at at, at Malmo, like they when they when they beat uh, SK or Luminosity at the time? Um, was it Luminosity at the time, I think so. Yeah, it was Luminosity. Uh, well, the thing is, first of all, that is literally the series that made Luminosity like, you know what, this cash map, yeah, I'm giving that up now, not playing that anymore, <laughs> so that, in a way, they helped Luminosity out there, probably helped them definitely win that next yeah. major, so that one helped, uh, that was legit, but again, that was the first instance anyone had ever seen them, at that point, remember, yeah. no one had ever played them offline, because they'd actually fucking got disqualified from Taipei, like, seconds before it began, so we didn't even see them yeah. play that one, then they, they came to that tournament, had that shock result, then there was the Asian minor, where actually they initially lost to Renegades in the upper bracket, but then they came out and beat them in a really close series in, like, the final. So, okay, that was, like, legit, but again, that Renegades was, like, a, I mean, to me, that was, like, a 15th best team in the world, you know, they weren't, like, a very high up team. So then this one was cool in terms of the upset, but then again, the problem is you didn't complete the upset, you didn't get out the group, so there's my problem with that, right? It's like... Yep. If if you if you'd gotten out of the group, great. This is like a best of one upset. Like, okay, congrats, you won a best of one. Like, what more do you want? And again, put it on the other side this time. You're also against a team that's playing their first ever LAN map, a Navi. Never played offline before. So I don't put too much stock in it. Like it's cool. Like I think it's def here's the difference. It's definitely nice to have teams that can in a legit way get a crazy upset. But like I can't put much stock in it. Like I can't say it's gonna happen again and I can't say they're gonna build off that. I have to see that proven to me, you know. And so far, they haven't yeah. proven it, you know. Yep. Yeah, they. Um, yeah, no. I w I just want to see them at more events. It's a shame that we've seen them so many times get you know the disqualification. They had the visa issues as well. Um, I think that was for for E League last season, um, and they also had the visa issues for what they. It was for their major qualifier, wasn't it? This past major. Uh, no, they went to the major qualifier. They just didn't qualify. But didn't qualify. They were one of what the teams that lost, like early on. I think they lost. I think they won like one map and lost three or something i'll have a look if you want no no no. i'm just trying to think of there was there was another i thought there was another event that they didn't get visas for for some reason but maybe i'm think I maybe think i'm just so. wrong could yeah, just be wrong that was just e-league i think <laughs> oh well um what about uh who else there was who else is there at the star letter but astralis choked again that was fun even so, it obviously was a positive that they got to that point in the series. Yeah. They won a map off in the airport. Okay, that, Especially with their recent form. That's all That's all legit stuff. Like To me, the problem with Astralis is they're in such bad form and they're in such a bad place in terms of... I, I, I mean, I thought that Kirby move could be the answer, you know? That seemed like that yeah. could be a big change. That... I mean, it has to be this and a lot more before you can really start talking about it as like a legit contender or something. I mean, I was I was just talking when I was at Northern Arena because Heroic was there. I talked to to Freeze and I talked to Valdi, and they they both basically mentioned that they they would much rather play Astralis over Dignitas. They don't think they match up very well with Dignitas at all. So every time they they're at these lands, like I, I was just kind of had to chuckle in the semifinal where they're facing Dignitas, but like they always want to be able to play Astralis because they just they have so much confidence. They think they can just beat them straight up. Okay. See, the thing with that is. Like, here's the thing. It might sound weird, but I'm still not ready to give up on this Astralis lineup. Like, I still... It does sound a little bit weird. It does, doesn't it? It does. It sounds <laughs> fucked up. Like, here's the thing. I have given up on the notion they're going to be the best team in the world. That's not going right. to happen, okay? But I haven't given up on the notion they can get back to where the old Astralis was. Like, you know, like maybe be fourth or fifth best team. I still think if you look at the parts, it, you can't write it off yet. Like, it still looks like they can do something. Well, admittedly, they haven't got much longer. They have had a few months now, and they have had a bunch of tournaments. They didn't have the major, but they had the rest of them. So this, They, they I, remind me a lot of Envy at the moment with how I look at them, just because you want to say that they're, like, one of the best teams in the world just because of the levels that these players used to be at. But, like, you don't see it that frequently. Like, Device is, is playing well. Like, they had said they, this was a good event for them. But overall, in the past three months, it seems like everyone on that team has not been performing up to where we've expected them to be out of the past year or two of experience. Like, these players individually just aren't at the right level. Oh, anymore. and by the way, I, this is a good time now that you've said that to bring this up. So, this is an example, Moses. Like, I've noticed there's a trend out there in, in on the internet especially 
which yeah. is really problematic, which is that people just always want to be on the, they want to be on the right side of the debate, right? They want to be the one who was, I, I was right, see, I was right. And so what happens is sometimes they'll do that even when logically it doesn't make sense. So for example, okay, at this tournament, part of why Dignitas was able to go far is that Cajun B actually had a really good tournament. Like he finally did have a tournament comparable to what we all thought he could do if he went to Dignitas, you know, it'd be the star player, look really good. Now here's what's funny. So he had that tournament finally. This wasn't his first tournament for Dignitas, remember? He played the Major, he yep. played a bunch of tournaments, and he didn't do any of that. He played the E-League. He didn't do any of that, Moses. So here's the crazy part that I don't understand is, logically, how would you go, ah, see, Cajun B wasn't the problem. He should be back. As yeah, but you just saw him have a bunch of tournaments where he shit the bed. Like, you just <laughs> saw by your own logic that that's not even reasonable. Like, that's def the answer definitely is not that removing Cajun B is what made Estras worse. Like, let's get real. No, I don't think that at it all. It doesn't have to and be I, one or the other, does it? It can be both at the same time. <laughs> and he has probably been... He's been extremely underwhelming. He's been crushed, Dignitas. hasn't he? Yeah. I don't know where he's gone, but yeah, he hasn't He hasn't really been that impressive. Um, and he, that was like the, that was the big thing about that trade. If you remember, this, it was like one of the only trades where people in recent memory where everyone was saying, this is going to make both teams much, much better. This yep. is actually like a very good trade to make of these two players. Um, and oddly enough, they both they both crumbled after that trade. Um, so, yeah, I think obviously it's, it's taken a little bit of time for both of those teams to kind of get in the swing of things and see what these players can provide them and how they're going to have to change things. Um, but but Dignitas is very, very fortunate at the moment that this is where Magis Boy and Config started to step up, like right after that trade is when those two players really started to hit a little bit of a, little bit of a stride. Um, because they're the reason, those two players are the reason why this team has had the success. Plus, I've got a statement here for all the Danish scene. Are you listening up, Dignitas? Are you listening up, to Heroic? Anders. You guys should want Astralis to do well. Because guess what's going to happen if Astralis keeps doing badly? Oh, no, I know you think to yourself, no, no, but in Heroic, we're getting all these really good results and we're improving as a team. And you know what? I love my teammates and these young players are playing well, but our, our vets are playing well. And in Dignitas, you think, you know what? We've adapted to this, like, the Valve coaching rule and we're now, Cajun's finally coming around. Like, guess what? This... It, what you do in your teams is irrelevant. If Astralis keeps doing badly, they will make a roster move. And guess what? They'll be taking some of your best players. And I know yeah. you think right now, no, no, but why would they? Like, heroic, like, we own our own org. And all that. Listen, mate, when the best players in your country, or best players of all time from your country, come to a new player and they say to him, I will give you more salary and you can play with me and win all the championships. It is history in Counter-Strike that almost everyone takes that offer. There's very rare someone can not do it, especially, unfortunately, the I irony is it's nearly always young players who definitely do it because the irony is a young player is the guy who actually probably has time in his career where he could fuck around with the other team still and do it later. But unfortunately, the young player, it's hard to turn that offer down because remember, someone like Valdi, even like nine months ago, was sat at home watching the price like, wow, this guy's fucking amazing. Yeah. Imagine if I could one day play with him. And now, all of a sudden, he's like... Hello, Valdi. I really respect you. I would love to play with you. And they say, well, I mean, oh, oh, my God, the, the cute boy at school has noticed me. Oh, gosh. Yes, I will go to the prom with you. Mother, <laughs> I need to get a new dress. Like, Yeah, you think he's staying in the fucking heroic. He's going to leave the fucking loser nerd dweeb table. He's going to be on the cool kids table. He's going to throw that fucking dress on and he's going to go yeah. over to Astralis. With some fucking lipstick on. And then he's going to let that skirt ride up in, as the wind blows by. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I think that analogy, that, that metaphor can just leave, end there, Moses. Well, how, you know how crazy it is? I mean, you were talking about Valdi, a young player. Look at someone like JW, who through all the success of Fnatic was even like, God, it still would be pretty cool to be able to play with Get Right. <laughs> I know, he's just like the ultimate fanboy, isn't he? <laughs> he's just unreal, isn't he? He's just unreal. It's like, uh, I, I had to, it's like, I was, it's like I would almost have to do like fucking some mad like fucking slapping him in his face like tch, tch, snap out of it soldier because he'd be like <laughs> I, I must go and join NIP uh, well, JW you, why, why do you want to join NIP Forest to get right best players I want to be invested JW you're actually winning all the majors now you, you, you're about to break the prize money record but in NIP like, I get, like <laughs> restrain him Restrain him. It's like tie it. every night we had to tie him up, and then in the morning, you know, yeah, they would yeah. inject him with the tranquilizer. That's why JW was bad for the last eight months of Fnatic. We actually had him on permanent tranquilizers. Hillary yeah. Clinton levels. <laughs> 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 and this video is demonetized. Okay. Well, it's a good run, Moses. It's yeah, a good run. Fun. The yeah. DNC will be all over our asses in three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> No, but that, you're right, though. That's what's crazy. It's like, it's funny. 
Well, here's, here's, an, here's a, an interesting story on exactly that topic, Moses. So when Nip was made in CSGO, no one knew that this team would succeed, right? Because for a start off, people from CSGO, uh, CS1.6, had never heard of those Source players. Like, actually, people don't know this, but so, uh, Freiburg wasn't even, like, a famous Source player. Like, he wasn't some, like, amazing player at the top. He was just some, like, okay-level Source player who apparently was one of those players who, when CSGO came out, made, like, a mad jump up in level, you know? So when they made that team initially, okay, so we all knew Get Right and Forest. They'd been in SK before that, then they were in Fnatic before Some of the best players of all time. That makes sense. But at the time that they actually made Nip, around the summer of... 2012 when they, you know the, like obviously before they announced it they like got their players together and practiced when they were making this move at the time exist was on Fnatic right and Fnatic was the best team in the world and there was still everyone knew this there was still going to be like three or four more big 1.6 tournaments I say big they weren't as big as majors you know but like ones were like 20k first but so at the time exist literally left the number one team in the world who at the time had won like two or three tournaments and he left to go to a new game that no one knew would succeed they didn't have any tournaments announced yet to play in a brand new team that no one knew would succeed and no one knew how the game would even play and by the way the only reason he did it is because he wanted to play with get ryan forest so my point here is that appeal that draw is huge because even though to me or you like if I, I, I'm very good at this. If I look at Get Right now, I think Get, get Right is one of my favorite players of all time. One of the best players. I, what's, someone who has a person, by the way, I have a lot of respect for. But I look at him now and I see who he is now. Like I see his level now. I don't, I don't get blinded by what he used to do two years ago. Unfortunately, players do kind of do that. You know, like in the back of their mind, they do still think, oh, he could get, he could get back to that level. Like if he really tried, or even worse, maybe they think, oh, his teammate just sucks now. If, he, if I was his teammate, you know, maybe I could bring that back out of him. So it's just like all undue optimism in a way. Do you do you think and I know get right uh, you know for for a long time hasn't been that same get right that we know but it's specifically at this event did you see watching on the, the player cam because he's always on the end of that camera that shows the entire team view did you ever notice because I saw this a couple times of him like rubbing his chest and I know uh, <laughs> look, looking like he was in pain and I know he had that okay. tweet that said that he is like his his stomach was uh, just like just causing super massive issues and they were playing cloud nine and he was hoping it would be better for the finals. Um, do you do you put any stock in like like that? That seems like that's a situation where, oh, how much pain was he actually playing through? Yeah, the problem with that is people didn't know this at the time, but actually when Nip was the number one team, he already had this like stomach issue yeah. where he has like some sort of like I can't it's like diverticulitis Crohn's, or like old Crohn's, uh, Okay, whatever it is, he has some sort of condition that's ongoing. And so famously he, there were matches he played that Nip won in the past where he played through pain and she was like he was in it was it was hurting, but he had to play and he, and that's another reason I respect him a lot, right? They kept playing, kept bragging, didn't just retire. But as a result, I find it unlikely that that's like some key catalyst one way or the other in this tournament. I think like, as far as I can tell it's just been his life for the last few years so I don't think that is to play with why he's not as good or, or whatever's happening to him in that sense yeah hmm. no the problem for get with me for get right is I mean it's no exaggeration to say his style of play in early CSGO was one of the most abusive I've ever seen in the history of the game. Like, like he he actually... Here's the funny thing, okay? There's a great comment that people often say who are, like, long-time basketball experts, which is that they say that Michael Jordan actually ruined the NBA. Because the problem is, if you know much about the history of the NBA, no scoring leader in the NBA was ever the champion of the NBA that season, right? Usually the scoring leader was the guy on, like, the you know the sixth best team who because he didn't have as many good teammates just went ham every game and then didn't win the championship michael jordan was the first guy to like routinely be the scoring leader and win the mvp and win the uh, and win the championship and basically did it all as well here's the key thing from the shooting guard position at the time in the history of the nba the best player on your team would never be the shooting guard right like you could have a shooting guard and an amazing center but they did it with like all the backcourt were the best players in the Bulls, right? So this was like a brand new way to play the game. Unfortunately, as a result, because Michael Jordan was so incredibly good at basketball that he could like defy all of these normal rules of the game, you know, like scoring leader, but he's still the best player. He was just a shooting guard, but the whole game's based around him. They play outside, they don't go inside. They never had good centers on those teams. What's bizarre is, because he was so good, it made lots of kids who grew up watching him naively think... Like, oh, it's not just because he's the most talented player ever or the, like, you know, the hardest worker, whatever you want to put it down to. They thought, oh, everyone can do this. So as a result, you got this generation after him. You can see tons of them. These backcourt yeah. players who just gun 24-7. They just fucking jack up shots. I mean, like famous examples like Alan Iverson, etc. They just jack shots all day long. And so the problem is, in a way, he ruined the NBA because he made these people think that they could do that. But they aren't Michael Jordan. That's the key detail. 
Even the best ones were never quite that level. Like, there's a couple of examples maybe that made it work. But in general, it wasn't a good formula to win. So the problem is, in the same way, I actually think Get Right ruined the fucking concept of a lurker in CSGO. Because a lurker was never meant to be someone who is always the last alive. It was never meant to be someone who baits anyone. The reason why Get Right could do that is because you can't get mad at Get Right baiting you and letting you die without, like, coming to where you are and backing up so it's a 2 on 2 if he always then wins the 1v2. Which he literally used to do. He used to just win all the time. And, and fuck it, forget one of the ones. He used to just win those every time. Like, it was ridiculous. Yeah. And so since he was so good, he, like Michael Jordan, he took his role and his position to the absolute limits and probably went beyond it. Like, broke some of the rules, you know. Like the whole point of rules is they're then for normal people. Extraordinary people, you know, maybe you can break a rule. So my problem is... I think Get Right himself can't play that style anymore. Like the, the, the game has evolved too much since then. First of all, there's way more good teams. There's way more good players. And people have now played a billion games against Get Right. So he, here's the thing. Because he's so good, he can still be effective doing it. He can still be a good player. But he can't be the best player in the world to play like that, in my opinion, as far as I can tell. So I think even if, in, even if natural form came back to him, even if the rest of the team was fantastic, the point is, like I'm saying... The reason why you'll never be number one again like Nip was before is because you can't recreate those circumstances. It wasn't just you. It was all the other circumstances yeah. as well, you know. Yeah, and I mean, that's the big thing as well now. I mean, there, there's so many more information plays being made by the CT team, so like he, he can't lurk quite as long. Um, and yeah, I, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that style. I mean, that style, I mean, I was a big fan of it when it was, at the time, when it was actually like really, really effective, but I think the meta has just evolved to where that very, very passive lurk style. The one way I've always had respect for Get Right as a lurker, though, is, is he's one of those he's one of those guys who would, you know, I, I always think of it, uh, the best examples on Inferno, where he would lurk in the, in the halls uh, over towards the Apex bomb site rest in peace inferno um but like he, he would lurk out there for so long like for like six rounds in a row and then on that seventh round he would be like the entry fracker he would just like run up the halls with no cares in the world and he would just yep. get a kill and then fall back and lurk so he's also kind of like the aggressive lurking style yeah it's not meant to be someone who's the last one alive and just stays alive till the end you're supposed to also cut off rotations and you're supposed to distract um and i and i think that's I think that lurking position has gotten like idolized because of him. I think you make a good point. Yeah, maybe he does maybe ruin that position a little bit, but um, people idolize that super passive style and say, no, 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 if you guys just, you know, go do your thing and let me let me try and be in these one on twos every single round. Um, that's that's a waste. That's a waste of a lurker. Like if you saw in my interview with Hiko, he essentially admitted that. That like he himself yeah. kind of fell into that pattern of thinking to himself, I'm the lurker, I always you know, I always want to be and here's the thing, because these are players who are fantastic in clutch round situations. So unfortunately they didn't realize the way, the way to play the game is when you are naturally given a clutch round yeah then you try and win it you don't try and like create clutch rounds for no reason you know like it's right. kind of counterintuitive isn't it to logically put yourself in a bad situation funny story as well just to tie back to the earlier thing you said about Tai Lu and how they have the high sensitivities um, Hiko has a really high sensitivity so you want to talk about someone who benefits from that just that just kind of having that high sensitivity when he's when he's on a clutch round I noticed this on Mirage you know his famous one against uh, against the old Dignitas lineup where, where him and Sean won that two yep. on four um, how many corners he can clear so quickly because he's just whipping his mouse around if his sensitivity is any lower and he can't clear all these corners they might not win that round so it actually is kind of interesting there's there's another area if you have to like retake a bomb set and you don't know where people are and you're trying to win a one on two that fast sensitivity not only can you clear corners but you can you can react much quicker if you get surprised by someone so that's also just a trait of, of Hiko's playstyle that um, has really benefited from just from that small detail but yeah, I mean, the basic point that we're making here is that when someone's in their prime and for some reason the style works, it's like you can allow that guy to sort of break the rules a little bit or push the boundaries. The point is that can't be the way most people play that style. I mean, another, another good ex basketball example, okay, is at the moment we're in the era of probably the best like pure shooter ever, which is Stephen Curry, okay? Yeah. Stephen Curry attempts 11 three-pointers a game. Now, if you know anything about the history of three-point shooting in the NBA, usually the best three-point shooters, like Ray Allen or something, I can't remember what, how many he takes a game, but I would imagine it's like half of that. So the whole point is Ray Allen instead, because he's such a good shooter, is going to look for opportunities in the game. He can take a really clean shot, and then he's going to make most of them. That's his logic, okay? Stephen Curry breaks the rules. Like, he takes a shot even contested and makes it. So therefore, he's yeah. allowed to take more shots. Now, the reason why I'm bringing this example up is if every good three-point shooter in the NBA tried to be Stephen Curry, they would ruin their own position in their team. Instead of being a guy who shoots efficiently, makes certain baskets from three-point range, and as a result, like, contributes to how the dynamic of the ball movement goes, they instead, if they all attempt did 11 shots a game most of them would see their percentages drop they'd waste a load of shots that their team needs elsewhere like inside if they have like a good post player and as a result they would actually damage their team so 
it sounds like it sounds like a uh, an extreme example, but it actually is in general something that I think is key for how people think of Counter Strike teams because you can, you no one can really just copy the style of like the best player and think that'll work. Like you, you have to be that guy for it to work. You know, it's like like this. It's almost no joke to say that the here's the secret to being a lurker like Get Right. So there's these uh, three steps, guys. So step one, be Get Right. So you think, well, that uh, there's only one guy can do that. Oh no, it gets worse than that because step two, it must be 2013. So even Get Right can't do step two. You see the point I'm making? Like, uh, yeah. you, unless you can do all the other things he can do, you probably can't do that mad aggressive style he does. Well, and this is this is probably why when Threat comes in as a coach, and he, he we saw like that that adjustment that was made was that Get Right was being much more involved in the early action as well. So I mean, that's that's kind of the benefit of having that coach is that objective vision, the, the obje- being able to objectively look at your players instead of someone who's been on a team with them for three years. Um, and this doesn't go just for Get Right, but having that coach who's able to say, listen, this this kind of style, this thing is not going to be effective as much anymore like you're, you're wasting a lot of potential you're just kind of a wasted resource for a lot of this round so get more involved in the action we want to use your skill set early um and and that that's where he comes in and adjusts things and it worked for a little bit um but but like i said they, they struck a cool balance but yeah there's um these these individual styles like people have to be able to adapt and that that adaptability i think is one of the most being a versatile player and an adaptable player um, not only over short periods of time, but over a long period of time, is one of the most important qualities you can have as a professional player. And I don't think enough people, I think right now in Counter-Strike, and I think right now in, in eSports, across multiple titles, um, come into Counter-Strike and they, they say, okay, there's, there's, these five, there's these five roles that are people talk about. There's the sniper, the in-game leader, the lurker, whatever it might be. So, some delusional motherfucker even says there's a clutch role, which is just like, kill yourself. <laughs> but like... Um, <laughs> But like they they look at these roles. And <laughs> How is that real? Okay, keep going. They they look at these roles and they say, "I am going to be this role. This is going to be the role I identify with, and I am going to work to be very very yeah. good in this role." But you don't if you don't develop being good at the other roles, you don't understand how it fits into the big picture. That's where there's the biggest issues in team play. That's where there's the biggest issues in figuring out how to play within the framework of a team. So I mean, th- there needs to be a little bit more adaptability between players. <laughs> Listen, mate, there's a lot of teams need that clutch roll. They haven't got that that spot filled yet. CLG, they need a clutch roll guy. There's a lot of teams need that roll I, filled. I, I've know. seen it on forums. And it's it just, it's so just bad. Me okay. I just, oh, okay, so, so here's the question. Okay, so this week is the NA preliminaries for E-League, okay, season two. And the draw is out. It's online now if you go and look on Wikipedia or I assume E-League's website has a graphic of it. And so if you remember the way it worked, because we saw this before, is it starts with 16 teams, it goes to eight teams, and then when you've got eight teams, you've got four matches. The winner of each of the four matches is in Season 2. Well, no, they're all in Season 2, but it's in the offline section, in the group stage, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's the, so good last I know. Time. So here's the key detail, okay? is that already, when I look at all these this bracket, unlike the EU one, where it was obvious it was going to make it in, there's a lot of potential upsets here, Moses. Like, I'll give you an example, okay? In the first round, SK, if they win, will play the winner of Counter Logic Gaming and NRG. Now, the problem right there, Moses, is, remember, we need SK to be in this league. They're the best team in the world. We need yeah. them to get to the offline part and be in the group stage. But you know what? As much as everyone can make fun of CLG's pickups, CLG's pickups get get shit done online. That's what you call a potential banana skin, right? <laughs> By the way, just just to throw this out there, I know the point you're getting okay. at, but they had a they had a pretty good Northern Arena, Ethan and Sim Rosa. But let's I just want to put that out there. Yeah, because yes, they got shit they are, set up now. Yeah, they are they very followed, they are very effective. They followed online. the path to becoming pro. <laughs> the snapping on fools. <laughs> um, They're inside people's heads. I I actually I look at that I think dude I think NRG is in a bad spot right now I think CLG is going to beat them uh, but SK I, I don't know if I'd look at it from the angle of CLG or NRG being able to beat them I think I would look at it is is SK going to fumble something again like they don't have Showtime anymore Fur, Fur's going to be back in this matchup are they going to come in ready to play is he going to be at a level are they going to feel comfortable and confident enough considering all the struggles they've had considering the time they had off and that Fur had away to be able to actually not not let themselves get upset in this season because here's one of the funny things like I actually really think part of why Virtus Pro and Na'Vi was so terrible online this year despite at different times being very good teams is because 
100% of the pressure is on them when they play the online game. Like, they're thinking in the back of their mind, well, obviously we should be at the line. We're one of the best land teams. Like, you know, in fact, you know what? It's bullshit we even have to play online. Like, oh, this other team, you know, that guy's that player is an onliner, you know, he wouldn't be as good against me online. All these things go through their minds. And so if you're SK, it's the same thing. We should already be in E-League. Like, oh, you know, there's no way we should be possibly be able to do CLG. Oh, that guy isn't even good at... Well, none of these things matter in this match. You have to win this best of three. If you don't, you're not going to be in the offline portion. Is it possible, yeah. though? You think CLG could do it? it? Is a best of three, remember? Uh, no, I don't. I mean, it is it is possible, but no, I don't. I don't think. I think it's th- it's such a slim chance. It's like a five percent chance. But here's like, the thing, Moses. The next part of the bracket is fucking insane, because we have Optic versus Cole, and they play the winner of Renegades Luminosity. So you've got three teams there. Well, I mean, Luminosity, obviously, only in the minds of people who vote are good. But Renegades and Optic, I mean, both these teams potentially could be in E-League. So yeah, what are I your actually, thoughts on that part of the bracket? I, I, I'm going to love that Optic and uh, Renegades ma- matchup. I, I think that I think that those two teams should move on, obviously, out of the first round. But I, I'm going to love that matchup because I actually think Renegades is going to be a good team. I think they have a lot of really, really talented and skilled players. And I think they're going to surprise a lot of people at the end of this year with how good they can be. It might not be here in E-League. Um, I, I could take, once again, we talked about, the, I think we talked about this last night, for whatever reason, I just don't really like Optic, and they have all that confusion of, of, all, of all their players, they don't even know who's on the team anymore, I don't even know who's on the team anymore, um, but I think Renegades can, can take that one, and I think if I'm Optic, I'm very, very worried about that matchup. I, so, I'll, I'll even say right now, I'll even, take, I'll even take Renegades right here on this show. Okay. I think Optic could do it. I think that's a pretty 50 50 one, personally. I'm not, I don't hate Optic as much as you. I don't think that everyone who plays console <laughs> games are just total plebs and that green wall is for cowards and, and pussies. And that the only wall that you care about is that when your revolution comes, they will be the first to get to the wall. <laughs> actually, the irony, Moses, is I actually think all those things. I think, I think console games are fucking dog shit. I don't really care about Optic's fans. But I don't think the team's as bad as people think. Plus, it's online. Okay, I don't ne- think they're bad. I just don't have. I don't. I don't ever. I don't ever look at that team and say I can envision them beating somebody. I don't think they're bad. I just don't see them. Ah, there's just. I don't know. Here's here's a really difficult one for you, Moses, because I don't know if you're aware of this, but in the next section of the bracket is where Immortals, TSM, and Selfless are. Now, here's yeah. something that was announced today, which is that for the for this online portion, Desi will play instead of Twist because of the age restriction in this part of the qualifier. So this is not the same TSM we've seen at LAN recently. So, yeah. first of all, does TSM beat Selfless if they don't have Desi, if they have don't Desi instead of Twist? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Although Selfless, much like CLG, has a lot of those online players we like talking about. Doesn't it consider... Well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that, that one goes without saying, right? That, <laughs> that team is nuts. The team, uh, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think TSM beats Selfless even even without even without him. I think I think Desi is good enough. I think this is the kind of team that I think Desi will really um, his play style. Because here's the interesting thing: this his play style would be very good against the players of Selfless who are very inexperienced at, at professional competition who still haven't played that much. But at the same time, I know that the way that Ryu has them playing is going to be. Uh, a lot of focus on early round discipline. So, I mean, they're going to be looking for some of his more aggressive plays, you imagine. And, and also, Desi is, as skilled as he is, he's, he's kind of a one-trick pony. His, it's, it's the aggression that, that is really his success. That's what he's good at. So you know if he's having a bad game especially, he's going to start pushing. He's going to start being more and more aggressive. And, and Selfless will know that. Ryu will have warned them about that. So they'll be prepared for that. I still think TSM wins. I have a lot of – I mean, I think I think everyone else will be fine on that team. That's the problem with Desi though is that – here's the thing. He does have skill. He, he actually does have yeah. pretty good skill. Problem is in-game and out of the game, he's just a bit of a fuck boy. <laughs> <laughs> It's not about. Here's the thing. It's, in game, it's not even a bad description, right? He, he just is a bit of a yeah. fuckboy the way he plays. Uh, fuckboy was the last word I expected. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, okay. No, that that works. Yeah, that's that's yeah. a good way to put it. But so, I still think I don't. And, and grand scheme of things, I don't think it matters because I think Immortals is on the other side of that bracket, yeah. that mini bracket, and I think Immortals will take that that spot. So that's the problem for TSM. This is like the last. Well, I mean, you have no choice with Twist Six. He's underage, but. Unfortunately, that fucks you because I'm. Pre- I, I think that means they don't get into the offline portion. I think it's probably just Immortals that goes through, and we get yep. to write that wrong and see Immortals. And by the way, I can't wait to see Immortals at Ely. I think that'll be sick. Yeah, I would love that. Okay, so on the bottom part of the bracket, 
Team Liquid plays E United, so who gives a fuck about that? But then we have Echo Fox play Splice, and then the winner plays Team Liquid. Now, first of all, Echo Fox play Splice is the sort of dog shit game that we've been seeing all the time now. But admittedly, Splice had like a stand in at Northern Arena, right? Yeah, Machine Gun got in the Monday after Northern Arena yeah. ended. So, so they, I forget who they use. They use Buzzer or something. Buzzer, yeah, some shit Canadian player who actually sucked a dick. Might be a nice guy, I don't know, but he wasn't fucking good in that game. Anyway, <laughs> so he can buzz off, can he? Yeah, he can. Tell you what, hey, buzzer, why don't you make like your hero Buzz Aldrin and go to the moon, but never come back? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, right. Don't even know why, could be a nice guy, who knows? Shit player, though, so don't, get the fuck out of Counter-Strike and don't try and make it as a Counter-Strike player. But yeah, you insulted me. Make it as like a fucking businessman. And then come see me at land and be, be, be dressing in some sick threads with a hot girl from South America on your arm and go, look, you made fun of me once about being about a Counter-Strike, but I'm a success at life. And I'll go, fair play to you. I tip my hat. You don't still play <laughs> Counter-Strike, do you? You are a little bit here. Get the fuck out of this room right now. Maybe you anyway. just inspired him to be like this, this fucking baller. He might be the guy. next Elon Musk. Yeah. As long as he's just not a Counter Strike player, just get again. If I can reiterate one thing, just get the fuck out of Counter Strike. There's no place for you here. You're not needed. You're not wanted. So, unless, of course, selfless or CLG need a player soon. Right. <laughs> anyway, yeah, they, they might. So it's hang around. Yeah, Team Liquid's <laughs> gonna destroy United. I actually think that Echo Vox for Splice. I think Echo Fox is going to take that. <laughs> Imagine now, the fucking so CLG and selfless GMs probably get emails every day now of people just like warming up with like an inbot on versus bots. Yeah. Just yep. like, can I be on your team? Like, well, well, no, why would you? But look, I'm cheating and everything. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't I meet the requirements? <laughs> Do you know how many tweets they probably get about that shit? How many messages they probably get it's about unreal, their players? It? It's unreal. Oh, unreal. It's okay. Does Echo Fox beat Splice? Yeah. I, I wasn't... I, I haven't been impressed by Splice, and I know they haven't had Machine Gun, and I know it's been tough for them because they really haven't played um, with their with their five that they they, they announced this roster months ago. Um, but they haven't even been able to play with it until, what, just, just a week ago, or two weeks ago, maybe. Um, so that's that's a bummer, but still, you, you imagine that there would be more... More to see, even with just one player missing, with just Machine Gun gone, I, I would have expected to see more if this team was going to, to, to kind of blow me away, if this team was going to be something very, very impactful in the North American region. Um, should be said that against Tier 2 competition, Machine Gun was a monster um, at every other land he's been to against the Tier 2. So this is this is kind of a bracket where he could thrive on up until they meet Team Liquid. But yeah, I'm going to take Echo Fox to win that against Splice. Roka's going to be back home. Uh, he's going to be online as well. Well, in that case... Yeah. Expect a better Echo Fox than you've seen any of these lands. He got all his dancing out at Northern Arena. He's going to be back home. By the way, he is a nonstop dancer at, at, after, at after parties. I don't mate, know why I'm telling you this. Mate, he has ginger hair. He's got it. You, you, you've got to understand. You've got, it's like being someone who's ugly. You better have a sick personality and get really good at something. Now, in his case, ironically, he's just good at dancing. He hasn't done, like, he, he's got two of the three against him there. But yeah. See if you can figure that out, kids. I put something in there, so. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. So also, I doesn't even have that good a personality based on what I've heard, actually. So, <laughs> so Echo Fox beats Splice. <laughs> I really hope Machine Gun just goes ham, though. That would be so sick if he's like some that sick player fun. in NA. Yeah. Well, apparently, I, I just, I, I mean, apparently he didn't have. Uh, Davey said this in the interview with Richard Lewis that Machine Gun didn't even have a computer at home in uh in right. mongolia when they were playing so they were always at a land center so i mean he's he's now on he's got a team house out in la they got a pool they've got probably monster baller pcs so he's got everything he could probably want so good for him so okay i think that team liquids in the same exact spot sk is like okay we all want to see them in season two we all well offline portion of season two fuck this episode we all want to see them in the offline portion of it's the, I'm not even on e-league right now why do I care we all want to see them in the offline portion right they should be yep. there but Echo Fox online with your brand new lineup can happen right no. isn't this upset potential uh, I, it, it can it's, I mean it's it's more likely than I think CLG beating SK for instance but I, I still think Team Liquid is going to be massive favourites in that one um yeah, I, I have way too much faith in Team Liquid to drop that against Echo Fox. That would start to be, that would start to be if you're Team Liquid like red flag territory. Because one thing that's been crazy about Liquid ever since the major, ever since obviously they get to the finals, Simple Leaves, they've been so quiet. They haven't like done anything. They weren't at Northern Arena. They haven't been at any events. They haven't like I don't know what they've been doing. 
I don't, it's okay. I don't know. There'll be an ESO in New York. Yeah. Don't worry, mate. So, okay, last thing to talk about is that this weekend is DreamHack Bucharest. And wow. open this up because we've got the two groups set out there. Now, there's eight teams in the tournament. No one's super sick. Like, basically, the teams are Cloud9, Dignitas, Envious, FaZe, Flipside, Virtus Pro, Gambit, and Heroic. Now, what's good about this is, okay, in theory, Virtus Pro are like a top contender, world class team. That one's, that one's legit, okay. But aside from Virtus Pro, basically, all the rest of these teams are like positions 6 to 12 out of the world or something you know it's that sort of a range so here's the thing on, on on one level it doesn't have that many like super sick teams but actually has a pretty solid spread otherwise like this is a, this is a very competitive tournament i think where this is one where the results could go anyway like and these are crazy i think so well especially when you consider that the two teams that you would normally say are that should win this virtus pro i mean that's that's a team that's been so incredibly up and down uh, and then I guess Envy would be the other one. I mean, not not based off this, but like that that with all the talent on that team and the fact that they were tier one for so long, they're very up and down as well at the moment. So I mean, I mean, even even though they're technically supposed to be higher up in the standings, I think this is pretty pretty even cool tournament. Who do you think will win this tournament? <sighs> it's hard, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Um... <laughs> I actually, you know, God, that sucks. Because I do want to say Virtus Pro, but you just can't ever rely on it, can you? Yep. Um, until you, especially until you see them playing in the event. I wouldn't be surprised if one of the Danish team takes it. To be honest with you, I wouldn't be surprised if we say Dignitas or Heroic take this event. Um, Face has got some skill, but I'm just not confident in them. Cloud Nine, I, I think, still has to prove it as well. I think Cloud Nine can go to can go to the finals or to the semis, but I don't know about winning it. Because, yeah, the problem here is I actually sort of have a rule that I almost never bet on Virtus Pro because yeah, the only times they win is the unexpected times. So, in general, you actually, I think you win out if you go against them. Like, they will they will often do you favor and lose in those late situations. <clears throat> I will say with this field, they should win. Like, uh, when we think of what they can do at their top level, they should be capable of beating everyone in this tournament. Problem, obviously, is when you look at the group stage, let me have a look. The group stage is... BO ones, yeah, it's BO one except there's a, it says there's a BO three, so I assume that means that the BO three is the last game, like yeah, the elimination decided. match. So in that scenario, you have to figure like VP should make it out, like because the, they can get a best of three as long as they win one map. So I have to figure they'll make the playoffs. If they make the playoffs, then in series play is where they are wicked, like they are very good there. So they certainly could win the tournament. The problem is. Half of these teams are like skilled players, but on the downside. Half of them are like up and coming teams, but can they win the tournament? So, okay, you know what? This is absolutely ridiculous because fuck this team and fuck everyone in this team and their monkey ass. But I actually think Envious could win this tournament, mate. <laughs> I'm going with Envious, okay? Are you really? That's bold as fuck, right? That is, that really is bold. bold. I'll do something equally as bold, okay. but I think less unexpected, and I'll just take Cloud9 to win it. Well, that's not quite as. It's pretty predictable. Okay, you can take Cloud9, take an Envious. You know who else could actually win this event, oddly enough, though? I mean, okay. because of all the discussion, obviously we think a lot of teams it's can phase. win. I was going to say phase, yeah. Problem with that one is, though, again, that logic of, like, well, look at the lineup they should. Like, they, yeah, but they haven't every single time they've ever <laughs> had the chance to. So I don't buy them in that, in a sense. I have to say, the problem I have uh, with the Heroic one is I feel like, in terms of form, Heroic should be able to win it, but... Whenever a team has sick form, like they do out of nowhere, I always wonder, like, one, is that, like, have I just seen, like, your 10 out of 10 form? Are you already, like, you know, blowing up, like, a, a full gale 10? Is this, like, the best you can do? Because if, if so, then they probably won't win the tournament. And then secondly, yeah. again, are you just going to do this every tournament? Am, am I just going to see a drop-off sooner or later? Like, is this the tournament where you just have an average tournament and Modi isn't just suddenly revitalizing his whole career, Valde isn't going completely ham? So I, I, I kind of get betting against them for now. I can't believe you just took Envy. I do think as an outsider, though, Dignitas probably isn't that ridiculous. Like They have yeah, gradually no. been getting their shit together. And now they actually look pretty stable like across the team, you know. I'm assuming NBK is going to be back with Envy? Yeah, as far as I know, there's no standing situation for this one. Yeah, so. yeah this, this, this event will actually be, be pretty sick to watch. Right. Okay, so here's the question then. For the groups, in Group A, that's the one that's like VP, Heroic, Envy, Gambit. And it starts out with VP, Gambit, and then it has Heroic, Envy. So who, which two teams make it out of there for you? Uh, I think Heroic and and, and uh, actually I, I, Heroic and Virtus Pro, I'll say. 
Okay. Well, I mean, I'm picking Envy to win the tournament. So yeah, I'm, gonna yeah. say, I'm actually just going to say Envy and VP make it out there. Although I actually think what's funny about this group here is that obviously there's some classic upset potential already in this group because first of all if envy play vp man that is literally like whichever way the wind is blowing that day is who's going to win that yep. game and then gambit has beaten both envious with their old waylander lineup and they won a map i think it was nuke actually off vp at e league yep. and then heroics the new guys I, this is that okay here's here's how i logically say that heroic don't make it out is that of all the teams that they've played, I feel like this is the mix where Heroic's getting chucked in with tons of veterans here. Like, this is where it's a man, this group is a dogfight to get out, and I feel like Heroic might not get out of it. So I'm going to take VP and Envy there. What about Group B? That's the one that's Cloud9 plays Flipside, and then Dignitas yeah. plays Phase. Now, obviously, Cloud9 played Flipside in the playoffs at Star Series, and Dignitas and Phase were also, in fact, all four of the teams in that, in that bracket were at. Yeah, everyone, so, everyone except Gambit was at Star, Star Series. So who makes it? I think Cloud9 and Dignitas go out of Group B. Yeah, I'll take the same, actually. I mean, I think obviously FaZe are always some outsider, but I'm going to go with them not doing it this time. Yeah. See, so, okay. Right. I think that's it. Yeah. So that is the end of this episode. We will be the, back. The sixth end. Hope, the sixth hopefully end the sooner than on the last one for a future yeah. episode. Bye. Guys, I'm BW. I won three majors in CSGO, and this is Torrent's YouTube channel.